Welcome everyone. Monday, November 28th. Hope everyone's recovered from Thanksgiving. I don't know if anyone's ever done a calculation, a study of how much weight is gained. It's got to be the day of the year. I'm always reminded of the uh, advice. So hard to follow. You should eat to the point where you're not hungry, not to the point when you're full. At any rate, uh, back to uh, the grind. Never a dull moment. We've got a great room tonight. Good friend Gordon Johnson's with us. He's no stranger to these rooms. And we're going to have some fun tonight. Gordon, I selected uh, that song, one of my favorites. Um, I think it's very appropriate for many of the investors who uh, own shares in some of your uh, unfavorite companies. <laughs> I thought it was quite fitting. Um, That's funny. At any rate, uh, let's let's get into it. Before we do that, we got to dispense with our usual three dates in history. It's my attempt to teach myself something, and hopefully, you guys all learn a little bit. I force myself to do this every time I do a space. It's actually a good exercise. So, three dates in history for today. Uh, in 1520, Fernando uh, Magellan reached the Pacific. He began crossing the Pacific. Wow. It's 502 years ago. I did not know this. In 1893, women voted for the first time in a national election in New Zealand. And in 1919, American-born Lady Nancy Astor was elected as the first female member of the British House of Commons. So there you go. So, Monday the 28th. Um, I don't want to say back to a regularly scheduled programming because it's never a dull moment with this market, but I don't know if the Santa's been delayed for the Santa rally this year or what's going on. I mean, who knows? This, the, this market has no institutional memory from one day to the next. It's up, it's down. I mean, the month end is coming. Who the heck knows? Um, I have to say, um, I suffer from PTSD. It's a joke. But what I really mean by that is when I saw the action today, and, you know, I'll speak in general terms later about the ETF. I, I really, you know, for compliance reasons, I have to be careful what I say. But I would just say generally, when I saw the news out of China, um, let me talk about the past rather than the present. When I saw the news out of China over the weekend, uh, as we all did, what's going on with the uh, lockdowns and COVID, took me back to uh, January of uh, 2020, almost three years ago. I get some right, I get some wrong. But that was actually one time I got it pretty right. Um, I was uh, happily and complacently long uh, shipping stocks, tanker stocks going into that. And one day out of the blue, they fell 5%. And you know, you're told, oh, it's a healthy correction. Don't you love that, Gordon? When, when, when it's a healthy correction, it makes you feel better. You lost money, but it was a healthy way of losing money as opposed to an un unhealthy correction. And the <laughs> stocks fell again the next day. And now it's got my attention. There's, they're falling for seemingly no reason. And most of you know me well enough. I'm a bit of a conspiracy theorist. Uh, conspiracy, conspiracy theorist. I, I um. I go on the net, I read a lot like you, Gordon, I'm curious. And I started seeing these crazy stories um, about, you know, buildings being locked and COVID and all this sort of stuff. And I couldn't believe my eyes. But it was really a question of self first, ask questions later. The details to follow in the 11 o'clock news. So, you know, I got out down 10 or 15% loss within the two or three days. And I made some good money in the fourth quarter of uh, 19. But I neatly sidestepped a pretty horrific decline thereafter. And just to full disclosure, I didn't get back in at the bottom, so I kind of blew it there. But the reason I'm telling you this story is I saw the news today, and there's one thing I know, that's the Chinese don't tell the truth. We also know the vaccines don't work. We also know there's a point of pride they don't want to buy, you know, Pfizer and this other stuff. So I can believe anything. It's not that I know it's, I have the humility to say that I don't know, and scarred by my experience three years ago, I can believe anything. So watch this space. 
And I just thought about that. I said, you know, because I've been big in the energy trade and recently my timing sucked. But I was like, well, if this is the new narrative that you're going to be in lockdown for a while and all demand's going to you know, fall off the boil. There are a lot of positives out there, but you know, stocks have been wavering the last few weeks. I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, something there for everybody. I, I guess. I guess one thought top of mind for me was that you know who's going to want to put on more risk between now and year end. A lot of funds are on their back foot. They've had hard, a tough year. They started to make some, claw some of it back the last few weeks, but. I don't know what risk appetite is going to be like here in the next few weeks if this thing gets ugly. So just a word of caution. I'm not yelling fire in the theater because we don't know. But I wouldn't be complacent either. I'd be very wary. All right, enough of that. So, Gordon, good to see you, my friend. Uh, you and I, uh, we've gotten to know each other a bit over the course of the last 12, 18 months. Uh, we, 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 we've we been in this, um, uh, we're in that great panel discussion with New York Magazine. It was that Tesla investing panel back in the summer. And I, you know, I'll remind you, you forgot this. I'm an old auto analyst, so uh, I, I can stay in the ring with you. I can, I can fake it reasonably well. So in any event, it's, it's a real pleasure to, uh, to have you here. I don't think you really need any introduction. Everyone knows who you are. But, you know, let me just start off with a, a general question. For someone yep. like you, you've been so right in the fundamentals. But let's be real. I mean, you know, I've net net, I've lost money short in Tesla stock over the years. I suspect you have as well. You know, he won. Okay, I mean, he, the game's not over, but you know, one's bearish long enough. I mean, the fundamentals are one thing, but the but the, but the price of the stock, and you may attribute that to the mania and the stupid Fed policy, and which we'll get into that. But the question I'd like to start off with is, and you reflect over the years, you know, you were Credit Suisse and you were Lehman, you were Bear, and you're following all these crazy companies. It's often you can you can as Yogi once said you can observe a lot by watching. You listen to the investors, the kind of questions you get, the uh, animosity, the invective thrown at you because you're an idiot and you don't get it. I'm just kind of curious right now the way the pendulum is swinging. Like, how would you characterize you know where investors' heads are at? I mean, you pointed out to me you've been very right about you know the war wagons are circling on the electric car company that shall not be named. You, 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 and we'll go through that about how the order backlogs disappearing and so on and so forth. But how is the investor base responding to that? Or, or, I mean, or, or are you kind of in your own echo chamber? It's only, you know, closet bears like, like, like Jim Chanos and me who talk to you. So, like, what would you say about the investor base, Gordon? Yeah. Hey, George, thanks for having me. Um, I appreciate it. I, I, I enjoy your spaces. <laughs> and thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, so, yeah, I think. The investor base has dwindled down significantly. And, you know, I have to say that, you know, clearly people are happy this year, given the stocks down roughly 50 percent year to date. But, you know, you used to have the float or the shares uh, that are tradable. The percent short was over, you know, 20 percent. I think at the peak it was 30 percent. And now we're sitting at roughly 2 percent. Are we are, are, we're, we're talking about the electric car that should not be named to be specific here, Gordon? Yeah, let me let me be specific. Yeah. Tesla. So yeah, okay, go um, go, go for it. Yep. Know, people continue to say, you know, this is a battle against the shorts. The shorts have been thoroughly defeated, and they're no longer in the arena. I mean, when you talk about two percent of the float short, there are no shorts left. Now, clearly, you know, given the amount of shares outstanding, there are some guys out there who are short, and you know, I think that, and, and you know, you know, customers never disclose what their positions are, and, and I don't want to know what their positions are. Um, but I think that they've maintained a negative bias, but they also had to stay alive. So they had to get out of the way of the freight train. And I really want to discuss kind of our broader macro views and then get into the micro and get into yeah, the that, yeah, 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 that, that, that's a great idea. I, I but, but think think about this, George. Let me just say this real yeah. quick. Um, the Fed in their first hundred years of existence, their balance sheet grew by roughly $98 billion. And then in two months in 2020, they did 300 years of stimulus in two months. I think without quantitative easing, um, rather QE infinity, and I want to discuss how reckless this has been and what, what, what the outlook is, but I think without this, we wouldn't even be talking about this. So the problem, though, is when you have that, you mix it in with a SEC uh, um, that effectively, um, in my view, had a massive dereliction of duty. Uh, Jim Chanos coined the phrase the golden age of fraud. Um, I'm not going to say anybody's a fraud, but what I'll say is a lot of people 
got away and continue to get away with things that I think you'll agree, George, you know, 10, 20 years ago, um, these people would be in jail for. You, you add those two things up, and I think that created a basis with which, you know, people, and I won't say any names, but could, you know, predict that, you know, they were going to have robo taxes on the road. And we all knew that was ridiculous, and that was their thesis. And, you know, they could just continue making up these stories. So, um, but I think reality is setting in as liquidity comes out. In fact, liquidity isn't coming out as, as much as people think, but we'll get into all that. But I think as reality sets in, I think this company has big problems. All right, so Gordon, let, let's go straight for the throat then. I was going to kind of, you know, trigger you with a more uh, light. Let, let's just go for it. Let's just go for it. So let's start off, um, you know, maybe just fleshed out a little bit. I totally concur. We've lived through the most irresponsible, expansive monetary policy in the history of the world. And the, uh, the misallocation of resources, the lack of price discovery, um, I've never seen anything like this. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, bit by bit, we're, we're, we're trying to normalize and whatnot. And so where do you think we are, we are in, this pro- in that process? Uh, do you think there's a lot further to go still, uh, Gordon? Yeah, so uh, hopefully you, you can give me some time. And if I go on too long, George, cut me off here. No, go, go, um, Gordon. I'll tell you what. Well, I'm just going to sit back and drink, sip my wine, and I'll, I'll, I'll get out the gong if you're going too long. Go for it, man. All right. So if you go back to when, you know, uh, CPI inflation was 1.7%, right? The Fed's target was 2%, right? And what they did to get it up 30 basis points was the most reckless – an illogical move we've ever seen with this QE infinity. Um, and when you think about who's really going to lose, right, it's, you know, the poor people of this country. But more importantly, I think it's the U.S. economy. And I think we're going to see the U.S. economy lose for years to come um, because of the asset bubble. And let, let, let me explain. Um, so, you know, 1.7 percent inflation. They come out with this QE infinity at the start of covid they say they're targeting 2%. Um, and then two months later, you know, inflation takes off. Um, and, you know, they did, you know, $5 trillion of monetary stimulus, but they also enabled $5 trillion of fiscal stimulus. Keep in mind, right, fiscal stimulus is government spending. Monetary stimulus is Fed spending. But, you, the, you know, the government can't spend if the Fed doesn't print. So while people say the government was reckless, the Fed effectively enabled it. So you do 10 trillion of stimulus, while at the same time you have Janet Yellen running down the Treasury General account, the TGA account, which is effectively more stimulus, um, which was about another trillion, um, and you get inflation taking off. Keep in mind, ahead of this, they were saying, we're not going to predict monetary policy. And then when inflation takes off, what do they do? They predict it's transitory, right? We get to 7%, right? That was pre-Putin, that was pre-invasion, so you can't blame this on Putin. Um, so the problem is, once you light the match on inflation, as we f- find out in the 70s, it rotates. Um, you know, <laughs> you know, um, you think about, you know, the workers out there, right? You got five and five year uh, forward inflation at 2.3 percent. So what you think guys are going to take a 2.3 percent raise? No, R- railroad workers, workers just got a 24 percent raise over three years. So this is becoming entrenched. And then what you have is you have the customers of companies that have to raise prices, wages spiral further out of control. And again, it just rotates. So this was fiscal stimulus, but but it was, I'm sorry, monetary stimulus, but it was also fiscal stimulus enabled by the Fed. And in fact, if you go back and look at what Jerome Powell said, he vocally urged Congress to do this. So if you think about, you know, what everybody says is the stock market always goes up. But I'll remind everybody that, From 1966 to 1982, the stock market was effectively, if you look at the price of it over those over that time frame, the same level. In fact, if you look at the secular bull market of 1982, right, that started in 1982, you had a president at the time, keep in mind, and Reagan that said government was the problem, not the solution. You had a guy in office who fired every single air traffic controller because they demanded a price, a a, a, a wage hike. Now you have a president in line who's cheering a 25% raise for railroad workers. He's a union guy. Um, so, you know, you think about a secular bull market starting now, um, not likely. Look at valuations. In 1982, 
the stock market was 50% of GDP. It's now 150% of GDP, down from 225, but nonetheless still high. Um, you look at valuations. In 1982, stock market for multiple eight times depressed earnings. Now we're trading at 18 times what will likely be inflated earnings. You're probably going to get a big downtick in earnings uh, next year. You look at global globalization. It's been great for the world the past you know 20 years. But now, right, we're, we're, we're reversing that. Um, so you look at the last 10 years of this you know, massive bull market, you've had 30 trillion of quantitative easing that's now all reversing. You know? So what do we have now? We have globalization that's reversing. You have quantitative easing that's reversing that's now quantitative tightening. So I think that the base case for 2023 is an, you know, you know, your garden variety recession, but it could be a lot worse. And what I mean by that is you've had a lot of policies – um, that have delayed a liquidity shrinkage. Um, um, you think about like running down the SPR, right? We're now at 84 levels, despite the fact that oil consumption is now much higher, right? That's, that's temporary. Um, all the quantitative tightening, the QT that's been done has nearly been offset fully by Janet Yellen running down the TGA. That ends effectively any day now. She has to start running that account back up. When she runs it down, that's stimulus. When she builds it back up, that's not stimulus. And you think about it, she's running down the TGA when she could have simply issued 10-year treasuries for under 1%. I mean, this is just myopic stuff that makes no sense. So I think that it's not just Tesla. It's Dogecoin being valued at $10 billion. You know, it's solar companies that burn nearly a trillion dollars of free cash flow every quarter, you know, going up in valuation by making up non-GAAP numbers. This, this, this problem is not just uh, the car company that goes unmentioned, as George says. It's a lot of things. And unfortunately, the unwinding of these asset bubbles, in my view, and, and look, I could be wrong. I, I, I've been wrong many times before. But given this is my job and I'm paid to do this, uh, I got to predict what I think is going to happen. Looking at the macro backdrop, it's looking quite ugly. One other thing, George, real quick. I was talking to an economist today and I was asking him, what's the best leading indicators to look at for, you know, trying to predict a recession? And he was, he was kind of kind of kind of uh, close to the vest with the information. But effectively, what we would have all boiled down to is the conference board um, leading index, the conference board's leading index and also the BBK leading index. And if you look at both of those metrics, we're now sitting at levels that on a on a basically a, a, a probability adjusted um, a figure, you're talking about a over 90% chance of recession over the next three to six months in the United States. And one last thing before, uh, before we turn it over, George, you know, when you talk about a recession, everybody says it's going to be a mild recession. Um, that is ridiculous. It's, it's very hard to predict recessions, but it is impossible to predict the duration and the intensity of recessions. So people saying that, are simply selling wolf tickets, if you will. Um, so with that, George, I'll turn it back over to you. That's fantastic, Gordon. You came uh, breathing fire tonight. That's awesome. So let's pick up at the last point you made. Um, I think the most interesting uh, observation there at the end was your point about the duration of a downturn. People say, well, because, you know, we don't have huge imbalances in terms of we haven't, you know, overbuilt housing by a million, you know, zillions of units and, you know, car consumption, new car consumption issue is kind of depressed and inventories aren't totally out of control. The imbalances aren't so bad. So the recession should be kind of mild. So they say that's how the narrative goes. But when you stop and think about that, you know, there will not be the policy levels in terms of cowbell, be it, you know, more fiscal, more monetary for the reasons you set out, they're not really going to be so readily available. So I think your point about the duration is a really interesting one. And we, we talked a lot about in these rooms, time often kills more people than price. And so, I mean, Gordon, like, you know, even if the downturn isn't that great in terms of intensity, I mean, not to put words in your mouth, but do you, you think the duration will be, you know, surprise? I mean, what we just get this listless downturn that just really never, never comes up off the floor. Is that kind of what you're looking at? Yeah, I mean, again, I don't know. I, I can't predict the duration of the recession. But when you think about all the bubbles that have been built, I mean, we can get into the housing market if you want. We can get into ESG if you want. 
Uh, there's a lot of things that have happened that that need to be unwound. Um, that you know, I just you know, you look at most of the major crashes, be it the GFC, the global financial crisis, be it the tech bubble, be it the you know the crash in the '80s. Uh, they're all preceded by you know massive asset bubbles, and I think anyone who understands economics. Uh, you know, has read, read, you know, read, read the first book of our first page of an economics book understands that we're looking at asset bubbles, a number of which the likes we've never seen that are now, you know, being unwound. Um, so, yeah, I, I if, if, if I had to if I was a betting man, I would bet that this is going to be one of the more severe recessions we've seen. But for those saying it's going to be a mild recession, that's literally never been the case, and that's extremely hard, if if not impossible, to predict. Yeah, Gordon, I, I heard you the other day. You were speaking. I don't know if it was in another space or it was one of the rooms we were together, and you were talking about the bubble in um, sovereign markets, and and talking about the UK and the problems they had with LDI, and maybe that's a harbinger of things to come. Do you want to flesh that out a little bit for the for the room? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the bond vigilantes, if you will. Yes. Um. Yeah, one second. Um, so, so basically, I mean, what happened there was, you know, this new government came into uh, office, as everyone's aware, and you know they decided that they were going to effectively stick it to bond investors, um, and we hadn't seen the emergence of the bond vigilantes since the '80s. Um, when, you know, you didn't have this, this very, you know, accommodative, you know, monetary policy. And when I say bond vigilantes, it's, 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 a, uh, it's a neat phrase, but effectively, you're just talking about, you know, people who invest in the bond market, be it mutual funds, hedge funds, um, you know, pension funds, et cetera. And effectively, it, very simplistically, George, as, as probably everybody in this room is aware, when you buy bonds, the price goes up and the yield goes down. When you don't buy bonds and or sell bonds, uh, price goes down, yield goes up. So effectively, what the UK came in and said is we're going to print a bunch of money um, and push yields, you know, basically prices down. I'm sorry, uh, prices up and yields down. And basically, bond investors said, you know what, we're not OK with that. Um, so they effectively all collectively got together and within days, basically pushed the government out of office. It's the first time we had seen the bond vigilantes in a while, but it has to be scary for, you know, any Fed government, I'm sorry, Fed bank in the world, because you now have a bond market that is back in, you know, basically vogue, if you will, and can force policy, uh, but more importantly, force you out of office. So I think that the ability of central banks in places where inflation is out of control to, you know, affect policy have declined significantly. Terrific. All right. So let's go from the general now to the specific. And I want to get I want to open the room up to questions reasonably quickly. But I know people are going to want to talk about um, the electric car company. And I know <laughs> and I know people are going to have questions about solar. And this is where you come in because you've forgotten more about these topics than any of us will know. We can all BS in general terms, but but you got the goods. You're the real deal. So maybe without doing the full Monty, maybe just give us sort of like the elevator pitch at this point is, you know, why, how is it, how is Tesla different now? How's your view on Tesla now? Why are you more concerned now than any other time in the past? And then once we do Tesla, let's just talk about solar. So yeah. let's go to Tesla first, Gordon. Yeah, let's do Tesla first. So, so in a nutshell, right, Tesla is guiding production in the fourth quarter ahead of sales. This will be the first time in the history of Tesla that you've had three, three straight quarters, Q2, Q3, Q4, of production ahead of um, uh, sales. Um, so, you know, they're going to make more cars than they sell, right? Um, that is a problem, but it's a much bigger problem when you consider that they have two plants currently running at roughly 10% capacity, uh, Texas and Berlin, and they have a Chinese plant they're currently intentionally running below full capacity, right? Despite that fact, <laughs> right? Uh, oh, well, a couple other things. They've cut prices effectively in China now in the fourth quarter two times. They cut the price across the board uh, roughly 9% for their cars in China. And then they offered a, I think, 1,000 USD subsidy, um, i.e. if you buy before December, 
you get a thousand dollars off your insurance. So those are effective price cuts. Um, and you have incentives in both, I think it's Israel and Poland, as well as Germany and France ending January 1st, 2023, right? So that, that, that's creating demand pooling, you know, one-time demand pooling in those countries. Despite all those facts, there's currently not demand sufficient for the cars they're making. And two, again, two of their factories are running at 10%. So that is a massive problem, but it's an even bigger Massive, if you will, if that's not a double negative, when you consider that Tesla is currently valued at more than the next five largest automakers combined, despite selling less than 4% of the cars they did in 2021. Why is Tesla valued like that? Two reasons. One, everyone's saying they're going to grow their car sales 50% every year into perpetuity, right? If their sales come in at roughly 380,000 cars in Q4, which is our current estimate, um, that thesis is going to be blown to bits because that will not be the growth necessary for people to say 50%. The other reason people say they're valued at such a high level, and I, I don't think this is valid. I think this is um, a morally and analytically bankrupt sell side, pretty much in our view, everyone on the sell side who's covering this stock. Um, and I know that sounds aggressive. I can explain that. I, it th I think is morally and analytically bankrupt. But also, um, you know, retail investors and, you know, uh, money managers who um, probably shouldn't be money managers spouting this thesis. And, and that is that they're a, a, a technology company. Uh, why are they not a technology company? Um, uh, well, 95 percent of the revenues come from selling cars. The other five percent come from a profitless energy division. Um, and in addition to that, they rank dead last in um, uh, autonomous driving, according to Navigant. Um, uh, all of the promises made at Battery Day, uh, none of those promises came true. Um, and in fact, the recent teardown of the 4680 battery cell from Tesla revealed that um, one could uh, credibly allege that, you know, the promises they made at Battery Day or the claims they made at Battery Day, rather, um, were mistruths. Um, uh, uh, so you have that. You have the fact that, you know, a lot of companies have over the air updates now. Um, I was on a Spaces the other day and somebody was saying how Tesla is the only company that has OTA updates. That is incorrect. Ford, Mercedes, uh, 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 pretty much every EV car out there has over the air updates. Um, and if you look at the real world, real world range of their cars, um, they're, they're on par or lesser than all of the most of, I'm sorry, most of the major automotive cars out there. So they don't lead on technology. They lag uh, the industry on technology and they derive their revenues from selling cars. And the growth, I think, in Q4 is going to be demonstrably below the 50 percent number that everybody's looking for. And, and here's the thing, George. I think the real investors in this stock and when I say real investors, I shouldn't say real investors. I say big investors in this stock. That is going to be the straw that broke the camel's back, if you will. When that growth slows to a level that isn't 50 percent. I think you're going to see a lot of investors running for the hills. Um, and, and in fact, if you look at the insiders at Tesla, they are running for the hills. Uh, give me a second, George. I'll pull up a stat if you want to open it up for Q&A first. That, that's right. Take, take a break there for a second. It, it, you know, it's funny. Gordon, Gordon's done terrific work, but it doesn't mean he's been right in the stock. I mean, you know, I've been wrong on the stock too, so whatever. Uh, but, you know, as I'm reminded, um, my old boss used to say, there's a, there's 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 the company and there's a stock and those aren't necessarily the same the, the same thing and just because you get to analyze a company correctly doesn't mean you're going to get the stock right especially when you're in a liquidity driven environment such as we, such as we've been in um, so yeah I mean it's been a fool's errand you know, I, I I've uh, in my last big play I'm being short the stock until recently those of you following the ETF. My last big play of being short the stock I think was back in 2019. I may have the year screwed up when it was thought they might be going bankrupt. The uh, bonds were yielding in the teens. Uh, Musk basically lied. Uh, I can't remember which Gordon. You'll you'll remember which lie it was. Basically lied um, uh, his way out of uh, that problem. Raised money, and um, you know the rest is history. But um, yeah, it was the um, it was the one was it was was it. Uh, was it one million robo taxis on the road? Yeah, it's it's. Yeah. I, I I lose track of it. It's I'm, I'm yeah. getting so old. It's just one lie after another. Um, but but Gordon, you know, 
how does he get away with this stuff? I mean, you know, our, our, our mutual friend Jim Tano's talks, talks about the concept of legal fraud. Well, in this case, it's not legal fraud. It's illegal fraud. I mean, it's, you know, the 420, it's it's the robo-taxes, it's this, is that. He makes these fanciful forecasts out into the future. They're so far out that, you know, it's not in any relevant period of time you can prove that he's wrong. And the relatively less knowledgeable retail investors, they just drink the Kool-Aid and, and, and swallow the whole story hook, line, and sinker. I mean, but but seriously, I mean, Gordon, talk about the accounting of Tesla. I mean, you know, you know their, 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 their depreciation rates, the useful lives. I mean, it's just, I mean, have you ever seen anything like this in, in your life? You're probably going to tell me you have because you follow solar companies. But seriously, how do they get away with this stuff? Yeah, I mean, I, again, I, I don't, I don't want to say fraud. I'm not accusing anyone of fraud. Uh, definitely, there's been allegations. Uh, but just for, for me personally, I don't want to accuse anybody of fraud because it, it's, it, I, I haven't proven it. Um, but there's definitely been concerns around the accounting. One quick statistic I wanted to highlight. Over the past five years, insiders of Tesla have sold a total of $37.188 billion worth of stock while they've brought $81 million. So they've sold a net $37.106 billion worth of stock. The last purchase was in 2019, by the way. So um, just FYI, if you, if you follow what the insiders are doing, uh, they're exiting. Um, but with respect to the accounting, there's been issues around the warranty accounting of them including warranty charges as quote-unquote goodwill. Um, there's been some issues around, you know, their, their, you know, their sales growing. I think it's like, you know, you know, 60, 70 percent over the past year yet or three years yet SGNA staying flat. Um, there's been issues around them ramping plants and uh, OPEX staying flat or going down. And how is that possible? Um, these are all questions that we have. You know, why do their accounts receivable um, stay high when they supposedly collect the cash upon sale of the car? Um, these are all questions we've had. But, you know, Tesla has never answered a question of mine. Not once. Email. They don't let me call in. In fact, if you go back, it's funny. I did get to ask Elon Musk a question once. This was when I covered Solar City, um, and I had a $0 price target on it. And this was right ahead of them acquiring it. I asked a question on the call. It was a Solar City call, but Elon Musk jumped in, and it was the first time I had really heard his you know, voice, and his answer was basically incomprehensible to me. Um, I didn't even know what he was saying. Um, it's funny you, that that call is of public record. It's probably the last um, uh, call that Solar City did. But to your question, how does he get away with it? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I really don't know. Um, you know, is rolling a truck down the hill worse than having a video on your website from 2016 that says the car is driving itself? The guy's only there uh, for legal purposes. <laughs> and then the Hulu documentary having people from the company saying that, you know, they put dangerous technology on the road um, and Tesla deaths.com alleging that I think there's been 17 verified deaths from this technology. You know, I, I don't know the answers to these questions. It's yeah, saying that you're going to, you're going to have a million robo taxes on the road in 2020, meaning you're going to have level five tech when you're only at level two and your lawyers are telling the California DMV, you're only ever going to be at level two. I mean, is, is that – how do you get – I, I don't so, know. Yeah, so, so, yeah. Yeah, so go, go on. I'll give you a chance to rest. I want to, tell, I want to tell a story. You will remember exactly when it happened. I can't remember what year it was. I can't recall if it was 2016, 17, 18. It was some year back in there. I remember going to a conference. Uh, Goldman had a, had a conference up in Boston, and they had a panel on um, – a panel discussion about a self-driving car. And so they had various executives in different companies uh, get up. And, and talk about, you know, what they were doing at their company. And there was this one fellow, didn't work for a, comp for a publicly traded company, but he, he worked for a consultancy that consulted to all these companies, a, a big advisor on self-driving cars. And this was in the wake of, you remember, Gordon, there were a bunch of uh, Tesla engineers who um, uh, left, and I think went to work for the Apple car project. And I don't exactly recall if they quit or they were fired. I don't remember exactly what it was. But the FT was, I remember it was in the fall of, of, I think it was like 17 or 18. And the FT did a big story on this and talking about how, you know, uh, engineers are fleeing, uh, fleeing Tesla. And so someone asked this consultant about the story. And this guy happens to personally, he knew some of the engineers involved. And he tells the story, and this is 
tell me, Gordon, if you've heard this or if this sounds sounds about right to you, something you could believe. He tells a story that, you know, Tesla was working feverishly on the self-driving cars. This is already, you know, like five years ago. And putting intense pressure on the engineers to get the cars on the road. And they finally come, they have this one key meeting. And the engineers are like, no, it's not ready. It's not safe. Um, you know, we can't do this. You know, we're not going to. We, we, we're not going to be part of this. And I don't recall if they quit or they were fired. doesn't really matter. But Elon Musk's response to them was, because because they had promised the street, quote unquote, promised the street that this product would be out. And I'm not making this up. This is a true story. Elon Musk said to them, literally, Tesla is not in the business of selling safety. They're in the business of selling excitement. Now, whether they were fired, <laughs> whether they were fired or they quit, I don't really remember. Yeah. All right, but that yeah. is a true story. That I mean, surprising? yeah, is George, that surprising, look, Gordon? Yeah. So no, because you know Lynette Lopez, um, who I you know I, I follow on Twitter, she's done a great job, you know, highlighting. Like for instance, she she you know she did a story that you know Tesla put batteries with potentially defective cooling systems in people's cars and knew about them that caused fires. You know, a separate story: the time he told his engineers to stop doing brake tests on Model Threes because the tests were finding too many defects and he wanted to speed, speed up the manufacturing pro, pro, uh, process, i.e. hardcore engineering. Uh, the fact that they've done been much quicker to do recalls in China than they have in the U S um, and the list goes on and on and on and on. Um, again, how does he get away with this stuff? I, I don't know. Um, it, you know, there's a lot of theories out there, but you know, our assumption is Tesla is above all laws. They will never be, this is, you know, this is the assumption we, we run with. Um, so we assume that nothing will ever happen to them right. and we just focus on the competition. That's probably not right, but that, that's what we have to work with now because we got excited about, you know, we followed all these stories. We got really excited every time one come up. Came. I remember I was, in, I, was in, I was in Italy. He completely ruined my vacation when he did the funding secured. It was my second day in Italy with the wife and uh, I spent the rest of the vacation in agonizing. Um, and then when, when it came out that he didn't have funding secured, I mean, that was the clearest cut. You know, this is a guy who needs to be um, you know, probably taken out of the industry because it, it's not just that he, he gets away with these things at Tesla. Um, it's that it sets a, um, a, 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 a blueprint, if you will, for other, you know, a, you know, you could say aggressive or um, opportunistic CEOs to follow. And the problem is when, you know, people put out, um, you know, products that may not be ready for prime time um, or may not ever be ready for prime time. And, you know, people invest their hard earned money on the idea that those products are going to be ready. You know, eventually it always leads to massive losses. And it's not it's not the rich that are hurt. Right. It's the masses. It's the people who can't afford to lose twenty thousand dollars, fifty thousand dollars. So this stuff needs to be regulated, you know, theoretically. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, I think, and this is our view, unfortunately, uh, it's not right now. Right. Okay. So uh, with that, uh, uh, if anyone has, has questions, wants to come up on stage, please raise your hand. If I don't know you, um, I've DM'd you and have asked you to please tell me your question. Um, so if you want to come on up, please raise your hand. Uh, Gordon, we're going to get into uh, the solar stocks in a minute. Before we do that, Gordon, though, I want to ask you, could you just speak to uh, the competitive landscape um, with, with electric cars? Um, you know, it seems like for the first time you're getting some really significant competition. The uh, Chinese electric car companies are very formidable, uh, you know, on that, on that side of the world. And then, you know, in Europe and then maybe increasingly here, you look at what's going on with uh, BW, BMW, uh, Daimler-Benz. So could you just speak a little bit about the competitive environment, Gordon? Hey, George, thanks for bringing that up. I, I forgot to talk about that. So, yeah, so let me just say this. So market share, and, and then I, I know what the bull, bull response would be, so I want to address that too. So market share, um, so in China, 1Q20, their market share was 26%. In 3Q22, it's 8.4. Uh, their market share peaked in Europe at around 18.1%. Um, in 1Q20, um, it was actually all the way up, back up to 18.1% in 1Q22. It's now... 14.8. USA, it's went from roughly 80.6% at the peak in 4Q20 to 64.1%. Keep in mind, competition hasn't really emerged there. Um, so they're losing significant market share in every single key market. So, well, people say, well, but the, the EV market is growing significantly. 
Well, if you look at what they sold in Q2 and Q3, and you compare that to Q4 and Q1, and the question is, okay, Gordon, why are you doing that? The reason is because their factory was shut down in Q2. So if you average Q2 and Q3, theoretically, they should have made up for the lost sales in Q2, right? Because this is exponential growth. There's unlimited demand, et cetera, et cetera. That's how the stock is priced. Actually, the sales in Q2 and Q3 were down versus Q1 and Q4. Um, and then you think about, um, you know, the FSD take rates, um, you know, by region. FSD take rates are imploding. Um, in Europe, they, you know, peaked at about 55% in 2Q19. In 3Q22, they're 8.8%, just, just collapsing. Um, in North America... Wait, wait, wait. Peaked, slow down, slow down, slow yep. down. Go, hold on, hold on, hold on. FSD take rates are collapsing. Um, why is that? Um, I think the reason why is because FSD is vaporware. It doesn't exist. And increasingly, people are realizing that. There is no such thing as full self-driving. Full self-driving is defined as ADAS level five. They're at level two. What, what, what was the nonsense he was crowing about last week? I think it was on Thanksgiving Day that everyone's not going to be able to get FSD. What, did you you saw that, that announcement? Right. So it, it, it was a broad-based release, uh, which, again, like you say, how does, NHTSA, how does the government let this stuff happen, specifically NHTSA? Uh, but nonetheless, they did. But it's not, it's not full self-driving. It's, it's, it's basically assisted, um, it's assisted automotive, it's assisted um, driving. But the problem is, and people always ask, you know, they say, you know, why do you post all these Tesla accidents to Twitter? The reason is because Tesla is the only company that currently has a video on their website that says, and this is from 2016, that says the car is driving itself. The driver is only there for legal purposes. By the way, George, what we found out, it sounds like you haven't watched this Hulu documentary. We found it out before, but what we found out is that car was actually driven over a number of days. It had multiple interventions and actually wrecked during the process of filming that video. However, if you watch the video, it's like three minutes. And if I watched that video and I knew no, I didn't know any better, I would think my Tesla could drive me home and I would trust it to. Um, that's just my personal opinion if you watch that video. So there were a couple of um, engineers from Tesla that were, um, um, you know, highlighted in the Hulu documentary that had some pretty, you know, concerning things to say about specifically that video, i.e. it potentially being deceptive. Um, so, you know, I think that the reason why the Tesla accidents are so interesting in our view is because you probably have millions of people out there who believe that video and believe the things that have been said about Tesla's car and it being able to drive itself, be it by, you know, the fanboys or by, you know, on certain websites or, you know, implied by maybe some of the appearances Elon Musk had on, you know, 60 Minutes. Um, and, you know, there's allegations, credible allegations from teslades.com that he has websites that you can link to. You go to his website that there's been verified deaths associated with Tesla's um, uh, self-driving cars. So or self-driving technology, if you will. Um, so I think that's why it's more interesting when it happens with them versus some of the other automotive companies. Got it. All right, let's go to a couple questions from the audience. Uh, we've got up on stage investment advices. Uh, please unmute yourself. The floor is yours. Investment advices. Hey, yeah, um, I have a question. I know, like you, yeah, I mean, I, I check like everything, what um, the the financial and everything. But uh, the uh, the thing is, like, I feel like so many pension funds they have to invest in like um, like Tesla, right? They they choose like for maybe like the ESG, some kind of like um, um, uh, allocation they use. So I feel like. Uh, as long as they still like part of the SP like 500, they will still like put money on Tesla because it's like, I, I cannot remember exactly how many percentage, but I just feel like they will just keep put money on Tesla until they replace with something bigger. I think like number, the biggest number seven or eight in, in uh, SPY, uh, SP 500. So I just want to know like, uh, how long you think like uh, people will still keep like buying this idea until, until when? Thank you. Hey, that, that's that, that's a great question. Um, in fact, today, I think it was BlackRock, one of their ESG funds shut down. The reason given was because the performance was not good. Listen, that is a great question. Here's the problem. Um, if if indeed what we believe happens is happens, i.e. it becomes consensus that this isn't going to grow 50 percent every year. Um, two things happen. Number one, people say ESG and essentially what that allowed was for you to aggregate and basically build your assets under management. 
Let me give an example, and I'm not trying to pick on her, but Kathy Wood. Her performance has been horrific, yet she's made generational wealth by accumulating assets. If you can use ESG or DFF, I'm just making names up, but anything you can use as a money manager to accumulate assets will make you significantly richer. I think ESG is one of the biggest frauds of our time, and I'm not calling any specific company a fraud. I just think the concept of ESG is a fraud, and I think the reason it's a fraud is because if you look at a lot of these companies, you know, whether it's the G, the E, or the S, um, all of them have significant holes. Um, I think of some of the Chinese um, solar companies out there who are actively using uh, slave labor in China uh, to make solar panels. Um, uh, and and they're, they're included in these portfolios. I think ESG was used, again, to accumulate assets. Here's the other problem, though. So a lot of these funds are ETFs. So the question is, do they ever sell out of the stock? And the answer may be no. But the problem is, as their performance lags and they stop accumulating assets, they have to sell stocks to basically um, make up for performance elsewhere. So if Tesla stock keeps trading off, as people realize, and this is our viewpoint, this is our projection, that it's not a 50% grower, the pension funds, et cetera, will have to sell that stock um, to make up for those declines. I don't know if I'm explaining that perfectly, George, but there's two, again, there's two problems. Um, uh, one is, um, you know, you're going to have people selling the stock. Um, and the other is, you know, as people underperform, you're going to have, um, you know, AUM leave them. And when that happens, you're going to have these stocks sold off to cover that AUM leaving. Let me know if that answered the question. Oh, that, 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 that's, that's fine. That's perfect, Gordon. Okay, so look, let's move on to solar, uh, solar companies. Uh, another area uh, where you've had a bit of uh, speculation and, um, you know, creative accounting, mark to myth, et cetera, et cetera. So, Gordon, you, you, I heard you again the other day. I was in a room. Maybe it was with Michael Guy. I don't recall. You were just talking from an industry perspective how it's being set up for a cruise and for a bruise and giving, you know, where valuations have gone, what's happening, supply and demand. So maybe just sort of give the general backdrop to what's going on in the world of solar. Then we can get individual stocks, Gordon. Sorry, George. I was on mute. Uh, so there's two key things going on in solar right now. Um, and George, you were probably covering solar, or at least you were looking at it back in like 08, 09, 2010. And I remember at the time, polysilicon prices, polysilicon is the material used to make the wafers that are used to make the cells that are used to make the solar panels. So in short, polysilicon is effectively a process. It's effectively sand that's heated, you know, at very high temperatures and a very, uh, you know, engineering slash technical process that makes the wafers that makes themselves, et cetera, et cetera. Anyways, polysilicon prices were like 300 bucks, right? And the cost to make polysilicon was like 40 bucks. So you can imagine the margins were astronomically amazing. At the time, the key makers of polysilicon were all based outside of China, but it's just a commodity process. So what happened is you had a bunch of Chinese guys ramp up capacity, right? Chinese, you know, the benefits they have uh, due to their, you know, communist policies, you know, cheaper labor, cheaper electricity, cheaper uh, cost of funds. So they effectively built a bunch of policy capacity, killed the industry, you know, bunch of supply hit the market, prices collapsed, prices went from 300 to 50, and every single solar stock, you know, was down anywhere from, you know, 50% to 100%. SunTech went bankrupt. Evergreen Solar went bankrupt. First Solar went from, you know, 300 to $12, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Fast forward to now, right? So what's happened, right? We had QE Infinity, right? You have all these Chinese companies here raising money. If you watch the, 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 the movie, The Chinese Hustle, it will anger you that these companies are still allowed on U.S. exchanges, but whatever, they are. So what's happened? These companies have raised hundreds of millions of dollars. And what did they do with that money? They're building capacity. And that capacity is about to wreak hell on the solar industry. Um, you're about to see price drops, the likes of which we haven't seen since 08, 09. And what happened then? Every single solar stock collapsed. Because even if you're a cheerleader, which most of the analysts are, when I say cheerleader, literally their job is just to cheerlead these stocks. Um, you can't negate the fact that prices are falling because every week we get a price update from PV Insights, Energy Trend, and uh, Infolink, three different websites that update prices. So you, 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 can't, you can't avoid that as an analyst. So you've had a massive increase in capacity. How much? So effectively, you have enough poly next year to make about 
450 gigawatts of solar cells slash modules. The problem is demand is going to be about, I don't know, maybe 200 gigawatts, maybe a little more. So you're going to have double the, the amount of capacity you need for the demand. What that's going to cause, we believe, is a collapse in prices. And that's probably going to happen at the same time that you not have only a recession in the U.S., but you have a recession in Europe and what's likely currently a recession in China. Um, so I think you're going to have a recession, if you will. I keep using that word, but I think you're going to have a, maybe even a depression uh, for the solar parts makers. Um, that's the guys who make the poly, the wafers themselves, the modules. That's the, uh, the, the Dakus of the world, the Vakers of the world on the poly side, the Longis of the world, the Ying Lee, uh, uh, the, the Ying Lees and the uh, Jinko Solars of the world on the wafer cell module side, the CSIQs, the, the Maxions, et cetera. But there's a bigger problem brewing, George. Let me explain. So that's one side of it, right? That's the parts makers. The other side of it is what I call the subprime solar market. And, and what this is, is this is the guys who effectively sell the systems to the homeowners. This is the Sunruns, the Sun Powers, the Sonovas, and a number of you know, smaller private guys who have not yet gone public. And effectively, what these companies do is, number one, they never make money. You look at the, the entire history of Sunrun, every year their free cash flow has been negative, and it's gotten increasingly worse. Same thing with Sonova, every quarter, mind you. Um, so these companies just don't generate cash. Why is that? And why do I call them, call them subprime solar? Uh, and they're, they're effectively subprime roofing companies. Why do I call them that? They don't make panels. They don't make cells. They don't make anything. What they do is they come to your house and they say, hey, put a solar system on your roof and pay me back over 25 years. And if you think about it, a solar system costs about $30,000, twenty to $30,000. That's a very expensive dynamic, right? So that's why these companies perpetually burn money and they have to grow every quarter to keep up the facade. But here's the problem. That's all fine and dandy when rates are zero, right? But now that the ABS market is demanding near 8% for, you know, to fund their projects. And, you know, last year that number was below 2%. The cost to do this is, is becoming prohibitively more expensive. And the way this works is, they, they, come, they go to a bunch of people's houses and say, hey, you know, $30,000, I'll put a solar system on your roof, you pay me back, right? That's a liability to them. And then what they do is they take all those liabilities, put them together, just like a, you know, a mortgage-backed security, and then sell it to a bank, right? Historically, the banks would give them 100% of the money, 95 to 100% of the money on those assets. That number has dropped to 75%. Literally from four Q or one Q this year to three Q based on Sunrun's own reporting, that number has dropped to 75%. At some point, they're not going to be able to fund incremental growth because at some point the advances the banks are giving them on these assets is going to be so low. It does. It won't make for sense for them to grow anymore. And when we reach that point, they literally implode because the interest expense is so high that without the ability to originate these loans and sell them to banks, they won't have enough money to stay in business. It literally, it literally implodes overnight. And if you want to see a good example of this, look at why uh, what was what was happening with Solar City before Tesla brought them. I believe Solar City was days away from bankruptcy. And look at the bankruptcy of Sun Edison. It was a very similar dynamic. But there's another problem here. There's another problem here, George. And here's the problem. I believe there's a big tax liability. And let me explain. So very simplistically, what these companies do is they go to the basically IRS and they show you the IRS a price at which these systems are, are valued. And based on that price, the IRS gives them a tax credit. So if, very simplistically, if I have a bunch of solar you know, systems, I say, hey, these things cost five dollars. I get 30 percent of five dollars. Right. Here's the problem with what they're doing. What they're doing is they're using these appraisers, um, all of which are either currently in litigation or have been sued for inflating the cost of these systems. They're using these appraisers to basically show the price to the IRS. The problem is that that strategy was originated 10 years ago. 
And the re- and it's not it's not law. It's just literally a verbal agreement with the IRS. And the reason the IRS allowed that was because at the time there weren't any solar systems installed on people's rooftops. Ten years ago, there were basically very few. Now there's four million. So the way that the IRS tax code is written specifically for tax credits is the price that you show us has to be an arm's length transaction, meaning the price at which it sells at in the open market. These guys show a price of $5. The price they're selling for in the open market is roughly $3. So there are some people out there who are alleging this is the biggest tax fraud in American history. I'm not saying that. There's people out there who are alleging it. And the rule that these companies are using is a handshake agreement that's not law. And in fact, if you look at Sunrun's response to the Muddy Waters report, they said that the reason why we're using this antiquated process from t- t- uh, 10 years ago is because you can't, you can't use a, a real market price because we include, we warranty the panels, we service the panels, et cetera. Here's the problem with that. IRS tax law states that you cannot include warranty or servicing costs and the amount you show the IRS to collect a tax credit. So what they said is literally against the IRS law. So you have two big issues here. You have the risk of basically, you know, solvency risk. If these advance rates that the banks are giving these guys keep falling, and you have the risk of a potential IRS action if they get off their, excuse my French, asses and look into this. Wow. So, um, Gordon, are there are any of the, I, mean, I don't know how much how comfortable you are discussing this, but are there any uh, solar companies which are more deserving of scrutiny than others, or are they all equally bad? I don't want to say they're bad, George. I mean, you know. Let me put it that way. Yeah. Um, I read a lot of reports, and I think you're of a similar mind about you know, Sunrun as an example. Um, you know, their cost of capital you know, wildly exceeds the assumptions they're you know, implying in their projects and whatnot. Some of the companies seem to have more aggressive accounting than others. Um, are they all, are some of the business models and some of the accounting procedures, policies of some of these companies more defensible than others? That's a great question. Yeah, that's, that's easy to answer. So let me put it to you this way. This is something everybody will understand on this call. This is very simplistic. So think about this. Sunrun burns about $650 million a quarter. I can't, I mean, it's just nuts. Um, and, and Sonova's burning a lot. They're, I think they're like up to a half billion dollars of, of free cash will burn a quarter. Um, and it's just going to keep growing, right? So how do you value a company like that, right? Some of these companies have negative EBITDA, right? How do you value? So what they do is these companies have these metrics that are effectively based on cash flow annuities. So effectively, it's a bond. It's, they, they, they have these 25-year DCS that they use to value um, their aggregation of projects, and they put in a bunch of assumptions, one of which, by the way, George, is you know, Sonova assumes a 4% total cost of capital. Uh, Sunrun assumes a 5% total cost of capital. Uh, Sunrun took their cost of capital down from 6% to 5% when the 10-year was like at 2%, and now it's at, you know, I think it was less than 1%, 1% now it's 4 But here's, 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 here's an even easier example. So the, the, the metrics they show the street are basically how they calculate their bond values, right? So from Q4 to Q3, the bond values that Sunrun and Sonova use their own internal numbers to calculate, which, by the way, they will not show you how they do this because, quote unquote, it's uh, material non-public information or what do they say? Uh, you know, we can't give up trade secrets. But here's it's very simple. The entire world's bond values de- decline from Q4 to Q3, right? Because rates went up, bond values went down. The entire world, be it government bonds, corporate bonds, no matter what. Right. But somehow, <laughs> somehow Sunrun and Sonova and Sun Power and everybody else who does these calculations, their bond values went up. It's that simple. How so, is that? Gordon, how is that possible? In what universe is that possible? It's possible in a universe where you use a four percent cost of capital when you're you, Sonova just did a deal, an ABS deal. Last year, they were doing ABS deals where the cost of capital was below two percent. They just did an ABS deal where the cost of capital was roughly 8%. Yet the cost of capital they're showing investors to value them 
has stayed at four percent for since they've been in, in business. How is the SEC or some, some regulatory? It, hold up, but George, the reason why they're doing this, I've backed into this. The reason why they're doing this is because when they come to your house and they say, "Hey, George, put a solar system up. It's free." And and by the way, your cost of electricity is only nineteen cents per kilowatt hour. The problem is if they took that four percent up to six percent, the cost of that electricity would go from nineteen to like thirty, and then all of a sudden it would be more expensive than just sticking with your utility. So in, our view, in our view, that's why they're not lowering the discount rate because then the electricity costs they show to the consumer will go to a level that basically kills their business. Yeah, in, no. addition, yeah. in addition to that, what people who buy these systems don't realize is there's something called an escalator in all of these contracts. Meaning when you sign that solar contract, you're locked up for 25 years and every single year, the cost increased by roughly 3%. So like everybody who signs those contracts, they think they're getting a deal on the electricity. They're actually going to end up paying much more than they would if they just stuck with their utility. Yeah. By the way, Gordon, we're going to have a uh, 90s random consultant up in one second. But before he asks his sure. question, he's got, he's got a good question for you. You just triggered me. I remember reading something a few weeks ago. Um, they were highlighting how the cost of electricity is skyrocketing uh, you know, around the world, particularly in Europe. And when you see these, you know, alleged cost savings, an ICE vehicle versus an electric car, you know, that's great. When electric, <laughs> it just reminds me, the model, the comparison looks a little bit different if you're using electricity prices from a year ago versus now. So, you know, part of the whole attraction, part of the whole attraction for electric cars is aside from the environment. And that's another bail thing we talk about later has been the cost savings because, you know, it's, it's cheaper to use electricity, but What's happening to that with the price of uh, the, the, the price of electricity skyrocketing, Gordon? Yeah, I mean, it's a good point. I mean, you can imagine. I mean, it's, it's becoming inefficient uh, to own an electric car. By the way, George, I'm happy to answer any questions that are, you know, aggressive, that people that don't like me. I'm happy to take on any questions, all comers, just FYI. All right. So everyone out there, now's your free shot on goal. As long as you're. I mean, Gordon's saying bring it. So as long as you're polite and there's no ad hominem or profanity, we will allow it. Um, all right. So hold that, Gordon. So uh, 90s random consultant's got a really neat question. He, he DM'd me. So 90s random consultant, have at it. Please unmute yourself. Thanks, George. Hey, here's, I'm going to lean into the front of it. When these pools of solar panel uh, collateralized debt came up, I'm sitting in a room and I couldn't understand how – they were all a paper and the defaults and the numbers just didn't make sense to me. How is it that there were no, uh, whether it be the, the time period, as far as the homeowner, the amount of home, long-term homeowner or short-term homeowner were buying these pieces, how that wasn't put into the loan, nor could they answer whether or not the, how long these people had been good debtors as far as the liability. Because my belief was that a lot of that material had rolled off since the last financial crisis. So I had a lot of questions. But ultimately, you know it and I know it, whether it's a bank or a credit union, they were all reaching for yield. And they took this. The question is, how much of this has got contagion in the, the banking sector now as this starts uh, blowing up? That's a, that's a great. Uh, George, do you want me to address that? Go for it. Great question. Um, so just so you know, I don't know if you know this, Credit Suisse is currently trying to sell off their entire solar ABS business to, I forget who it is, uh, but they're currently trying to get out of that business. You know the, the issues Credit Suisse is having. Um, but to your, to your question, how is it possible? It's not possible. Um, and let me explain. So Kroll, who rates these things, currently has the oldest ABS that I can think of. Um, what is it? The Callisto. ABS from Sunrun, they assume a default rate of, what is it? I think it's like like 5%, which, by the way, that's, that's in the best like housing environment we've ever seen, right? Rates were zero, right? The, the, you have the Fed buying you know, houses via mortgage-backed securities, and they're assuming 5%. These are the people who rate their bonds. And guess what they assume? Guess what Sunrun and Sonova and SunPower? They assume a 0% default rate forever. 0%. Nobody will ever default on a solar loan. That's accepted. Um, <laughs> they assume 
a 95% renewal rate on technology that's going to be 25 years old. In fact, most roofs don't last more than 10 years. I didn't even go over that aspect. The assumptions have always hey, been ridiculous. Real, real quick, yeah. that was my other question that I had for the room that no one could answer. Am I going to get paid first or does the, the mortgage company? And they said that it was it was being built as a home uh, equity or um, uh, a refurbished loan. And so we would be paid out first. And I just shook my head and said, I don't think this is how it works. Let alone what happens. how long some of these panels going to last. We're getting into a, a quagmire is what my belief was. Yeah, yeah, you are, because you look at um, both Sunrun and Sonova, call up their IR and ask them, hey, are you setting aside funds um, in case these panels, uh, you know, go bust? You know the answer to that. The answer is effectively no. Um, but I think, you know, the other issue is as as the homeowner, your 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 claim on the asset is 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 junior to uh, the taxpayers and also the insurance companies. And if the IRS, by the way, Sunrun is currently under IRS audit for the exact thing I'm talking about, i.e., um, them re um, um, uh, potentially uh, taking more money from taxpayers than they should. If the IRS rules negatively there. Uh, the homeowner will be subordinate to the U.S. taxpayers as well as the insurance companies. And I don't think they're aware of that. Um, there's a lot more. We, we, we could talk about this for hours. And, and I hope the yeah. room understands what you just said, George. That is huge. Whether it's the IRS or it's the actual mortgage company, these loans are third, fourth in line. And, and I think that's the problem right now as these start going bad. So, so Gordon, how much? I mean, and, and how much this is all just another egregious example of just malinvestment and investment, and what happens when there's too much money in the system, and and you know it's kind of inevitable as the tide goes out. This stuff is just it's just it's just going to implode on itself. I don't see how this how this continues. I, I mean, mean it, here's how it continues: if the Fed doesn't about face and starts doing quantitative easing again and takes rates down to zero. All this stuff will go back to the highs, if not higher than it was. The problem is I don't think the Fed can do that because inflation has just gotten to a level that, you know, more printing is just going to cause more inflation. Um, so the the kryptonite, if you will, to the the the, the subprime roofing solar companies, um, cash incinerating solar companies is higher rates. And if rates stay this high those businesses just won't be able to function much longer. I, I can't stress enough. And, and I'm talking about a lot of specific topics that are very hard to understand. I say that because it took me a long time to understand it. But the fact that the warehouse warehouses are effectively the banks have took the advance rates on these assets down from 100 percent to 75 percent in just two quarters time. I mean, why? Like when Sunrun said that and their stock went up on that earnings call. I was like, this is nuts. Like, people don't understand what this means. Like, banks are telling you these assets aren't worth what they say they are. In fact, they're only worth 75% of what they say they are. And yet, the stock went up. And people are, you know, just ignoring the fact that this company is burning like $650 million a quarter in free cash flow. And if they can't continue to originate these assets, they won't be able to service their interest for more than a few quarters, which means bankruptcy. Um, so I, I just, I don't understand it. But those, in my view, have been the best shorts, which is why I have sell ratings, a uh, sell rating on Sunrun. Um, the, the best shorts have been the ones that, you know, are, are very misunderstood by a lot of people in the market. Uh, and I want to say something real quick, George. I know that those pools are already, already pulling money back in from banks and credit unions because they're starting to default. And those pools, that risk pool, they get a, a bill pretty much of a payment that they need to make, and they're starting to make those payments. He is speaking the truth. That's phenomenal. All right, let's keep it going here. And random, please stay up there. I, I, I really like the, what the, the subjects that you're speaking to. Um, let's go to uh, my good friend Gnostic, and then we're going to go to Mike CC. Gnostic, have at it, my friend. Gnostic, please unmute yourself. Yep. There you go. go for it. Wow, that, that stock was over $100 a while ago. What stock are we talking about here? Sunrun? Sunrun. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it got all the way down to 19, but you know our price target is at around 13. 
Where, where is it now? Like 30 or something? Yep. We, yeah. We initiated at 40 with, I think, a, a $25 price target. And, uh, yeah, so it's been interesting. I always looked at the solar panel business, and I, I was really sketchy about it. It, it reminded me of the uh, uh, wind mill stuff that's in, down in California with all the abandoned windmills that, that went through government write-offs and accelerated capital cost allowances and then got abandoned. Yep. And I look at the panels on the roofs and think the same way. The, the question I have is, you know, I, I hadn't even considered it in, in the panels now, but from what you were describing, we have a compound problem of, of debt increase very, you know, consolidated into uh, consolidated debt and resold. Um, how much of a life of a system liability is that going to be? Um, I, I can't say, but I, I will say that I've been through one of these cycles in solar where, you know, think about it. Right. When, when Obama was president, I know this because I went through it. I, I and, and then you had Fukushima, too, which just crushed me. I, you know, I had cell ratings on a, a, a number of solar stocks. Then. But the idea was Obama's a, you know, a solar president. And, you know, this is going to be great for the solar industry. And the stocks rallied, you know, one year. But if you look at the over the full year of his presidency, you look at the TAN index, I think it's down like 60 percent. And the reason is because what the U.S. has done with the um, uh, what, Inflation Reduction Act, whatever you want to call it, build back. I don't know. But what they've done is they've extended a 30 percent ITC. And like all of my peers on the sell side are, you know, you know, just, you know, screaming about how great this is. But we've had a 30 percent ITC for like like 15 years or however many it's it's it, it was it had been in effect for a number of years. It dropped to 25 percent over the past two years. Now it's back at 30 percent. The problem is alongside that they increased the minimum tax rate for all corporations from zero percent to 20 percent. You use the ITC to offset your tax liability. You could take your tax liability all the way down to zero pre uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Now it's just 20 percent. So the total addressable market for tax credits is down significantly. So, you know, you have all this euphoria built into these stocks. But then the question is, are you going to have the demand? Are you going to have all this demand for solar projects like like one of the, the previous uh, 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 questions asked or, or, or point out? Solar is really a, just a stretch for yield. We haven't had rates this high since arguably the, the 80s. Right. So you, you have much safer assets in a 10 year two-year treasury than you do like, you know, basically asset-backed securities backed by solar projects that are effectively second mortgages on houses, right? You're, you're not, you're going you're to let your electricity, you'll stop paying Sunrun before you stop paying your mortgage. I think we can all agree on that. Um, so the, the, the point is, um, I just think that it, it's misunderstood. I think people are, 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 are unfortunately going to be awakened in a bad way here pretty soon. But, and what you just said about the reach for yield and, and kind of pinged off of what I said, that is the only reason that many of these institutions got involved with it is because they were reaching for yield and there was nothing else out there that they could put their money to work in. And they got caught in this now, I think. So, so, so random, if I could just hit on that a little bit. So I was listening to a presentation the other day, um, a very uh, well-known, intelligent uh European investment strategist was speaking about um, the debacle in the UK with uh, LDI and um, the whole the whole way the guilt market blew up. And he made a really interesting point I hadn't heard previously, and it sounds like this might be in your wheelhouse. He said one thing that came out of this, though, the fact that yields have gone up so much, um, it now is the case that many of the uh, UK pension funds are fully funded, and given that, in combination with the increasing scrutiny that's being brought to bear on this whole area. It's like, you know, how could you guys have been playing around with such, you know, crazy speculative stuff? And, um, you know, they're going to, you know, <laughs> criticize the guilty and, and praise for pra praise for the innocent. You know, given that you can uh, indemnify your liabilities, satisfy your liabilities much more readily with a yield at 5% as opposed to 2%, the incentive to reach for yield kind of goes out the window. You don't need to as much anymore. So I'm just kind of curious. And so he was making the point that a lot of these institutions now, that now that, that now that bonds are starting to yield something, 
they don't have to play home run ball by doing, you know, doing crazy venture capital or leverage buyouts or this, that, or anything else. Or sounds like uh, what you're talking about, you know, being involved in some of these solar projects. So, I mean, does this, does this resonate with you? Um, it, it, it could be that, or now that, that the default is occurring or the, the payments are having to be back into the, the mortgage backs or not the, the collateralized loan for the solar that they have the risk profile that they're looking for. So they have no bit more, no more ability to take on risky things like what the solar um, uh, loans were. That's what I'm seeing at this point. They're pulling it back in because there's easier things to make money on. There's no reason to have the risk. And number two, they've got the risk on the balance sheet because they, they took advantage of the pools uh, and participation in these in these uh solar panel pools which are the only ones i've seen of any problems at this point other than maybe a few houses but it's not like the solar panel issue so, so, so you're saying based on the words you know, just so we understand what you're saying that appetite for this these types of products is diminishing from from these sorts of sources is that what you're saying how how can i have an appetite for something that's starting to default <laughs> the, the risk is up now not down and you told me it was a paper you lied don't come back to me with a participation. Go find somebody else. <laughs> that's that's what the industry's saying at this point. At least the smaller players that oh, were I begging it. for it. I love it. This is awesome. All right, stay there, Randy. I love you. You're my new best friend. All right, so we're gonna do uh, Mike CC and then AG. Mike CC, please unmute yourself. Hey, thanks for uh, for having me up. And uh, Gordon, it's it's been awesome actually hearing you run through the solar industry. I'm I'm in the industry myself. Um, and I, you know, nailing it on the head with the, the cost of borrowing money and how that's impacting things. Um, <clears throat> but it, it seemed like there was kind of a, an over, and maybe I was misinterpreting this, but a, obviously an overwhelming focus on like a PPA, right? A power purchase agreement, um, which traditionally do come with a 2.9% escalator, but up here in like new England, for example, right. Where rates are going up 50 to 60%. Um, I'm just, I'm struggling to see how you don't think the homeowner is going to make out in the long run where I'm looking at people who two years ago when Rhode Island's rate was 19 cents and the solar um, base rate was 17 cents, right? And now it's doubled for anyone who would be with the, almost doubled with anyone who would be with the utility company, but it's gone up by like 1.2 cents for the solar. So that that was kind of one thing I was curious and wanted to probe a little bit on. And then sure. the other thing being, I mean, if you want to address that first, like awesome. Yeah. So the, the problem is um, what it all boils down to is it's these appraiser my, models. Um, and w uh, let me explain. So it was Alvarez and Marcel. And then the other one is um, I forget, but both of them are currently being sued by Warren Buffett uh, or Geico uh, for, um, inflating the cost of panels uh, and the cost of the systems uh, <laughs> fraudulently. Um, and so what it all boils down to is these models that these companies have. And if you ask them for specifically, ask Sunrun, ask Sonova, ask SunPower, ask any of them. They've asked me in the private guys, say, hey, give me your appraiser model so I can see how you're calculating these things. They won't show you that. Um, and I, I have an appraiser model. I, I got my hands on one. And what I did is I backfilled, okay, you're assuming a 4% cost of capital, right, in this model. If I take that up to 6%, what does that mean for the cost of the electricity? And, and, and what I mean is they show you, like Sunrun shows you what their subscriber value was in Q4, Q1, Q2, and Q3. So if you, if you keep the subscriber value flat and you take the cost of funding up and you just adjust the cost of electricity to keep that subscriber value flat, if you take the cost of capital up to 6%, it makes the system prohibitively more expensive than just sticking with the utility. So to answer your question, the reason they're able to, in my view, um, deceptively, potentially deceptively say that the cost of electricity is lower is because they're using the wrong cost of capital. If that cost of capital goes up, it no longer becomes effective. And when you also include the 3% escalator for 20 to 25 years, it becomes prohibitively more expensive. Does that answer your question? It, it does. But I, I mean, I feel like I, I have to challenge that a little bit because from sure. the PPA agreement, right, the, the homeowner gets a, a fixed rate 
um, uh, the first year rate, say 17 cents, that that rate of increase is capped at 2.9%. So you know what all 25 years of payments for that amount of electricity are going to be. And no, no, I mean, no, no. it's 2.9% per year. It's not correct. just one time. I'm aware. Yeah, yeah, okay. well aware. But if you do the math out, right, if you're at, if you get 18 cents as your rate and it's fixed at 2.9% and the utility company is at 30 cents right now, right? Looking into the future, I think I'd love to hear you talk too on like, what are the the utility rates going to do, right? Like as we, all signs and all forecasts that I've read are pointing to utility energy costs are going to skyrocket, right? At least for the next couple of years. So if it's, it's mathematically impossible if in 20, it takes 20 years at that, with that escalator to get back to what the current rate the utility is charging for you not to save money, right? Now, comparative to like buying a system outright, it, clearly it's going to cost you as a homeowner more money with a PPA. But relative to the utility company, I think it's honestly borderline um, – <clears throat> It, it, it's wild to me, you know, again, I'm speaking regionally with where I'm familiar, which the rates in New England are high, right? But it's it's almost irresponsible to, to make this brash like implication that people are going to pay la- less with the utility just just based on math. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, so, yeah, let me let me try to explain again. There's two things. Number one, please let me let me know if you understand this. So that that I think you said 17 cents. Actually, I think it's 19 cents right now. PPAs are 19 cents per kilowatt hour uh, for solar projects, solar rooftop projects. I mean, just to be fair, no, not necessarily. I can choose the rate that it can be anywhere between 15 and 26. Right. So, again, like I just want to go. I I, I think the the average, the average based on NREL numbers is 19. But so here's my point, though. I'm sorry, not NREL, but I I think it's anyways. My point is. That 19 is based on a model that uses a 4% in Sonova's case and 5% in Sunred's case, total cost of capital. When Sonova just did an ABS debt deal that was priced just under 8%, that's the cost of their debt. Cost of equity is always more than the cost of debt. So theoretically, their cost of capital is above 8%. If you plug 8% into your model, that 19 cents goes to like 55 cents. But, but the, the part that I'm failing to understand is that, OK, on Sunrun's end or on Sonova's end in the financials of the company, uh, obviously that's correct. But the fact of the matter is the homeowner is paying a fixed rate. It's fixed. It increases. Hear me. No, no, no. They would have to charge the homeowner. 50 but they don't. It's in the agreement. Right it, they can't raise the rate. That's the whole point. It's fixed at a two point nine percent increase. There's nothing okay. in the agreement let, that let says explain. we can raise the, the, the rate cost of your electricity in year zero. So when they came to your door and they say, hey, do this solar system, you would say, what's the cost of electricity per kilowatt hour? And if they use the correct cost of capital, in our view, what we think is the correct cost of capital, which is where they're financing their debt deals at, i.e. 8%, the, the rate in year zero per kilowatt hour would be 55 cents. Yeah, go, 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 yeah go, Gordon, go, yep. Gordon, let, Gordon, Gordon, let me try to be Switzerland here. Okay. Um, I, I get what each of you are saying. And, um, Mike, I, I think what it really boils down to is, you know, they're offering this. It, 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 look, as long as they can raise money at 4%, fine, game on. But they can't. And the point is, like, this is an unsustainable business model. Um, and, yeah, okay, it's great if the homeowner can, can, can buy it at that price. But that is not a sustainable business model. Um, I think that's all that Gordon is saying. No, no, let, let me explain, George. What I'm saying is. So there's a number of things they can adjust in their model to get the uh, subscriber value to what they're representing to the street. Either the subscriber value drops significantly for them to keep the cost of electricity at 19 cents, or the cost of electricity goes up significantly for them to keep the subscriber value at the level they're showing the street. One of those two things has to adjust. And I believe what they would have to do is they would have to adjust the electricity price higher which is why, despite the fact, you know, the cost of their debt has gone from 2% to 8%, they're, they're keeping the cost of capital flat because they don't want to change either of those other two metrics because if they change either one, the stock is going to get annihilated, in our view. Does that make sense? 
So it completely makes sense. But I think the part that's being missed here is for people that have already gone solar, when they get the agreement and say it starts at 17 cents, there's 25 years. Yeah, yeah, Mike, 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 let me interrupt you. Let me interrupt so I don't you. understand why that's yeah, No, Mike, so. Mike, Mike, let me interrupt you. You are correct. Those are the people who already got the agreement. But again, that is not, they can only offer that legitimately, all right? If their cost of capital was four percent, all right. If they're still offering that now, it's a loss. Yeah, it's great the consumer is going to do it. I get that, but meanwhile, it's uneconomic for the company or for the investor. So it's just it'd be like oh, how can I put it? It'd well, be like you know, they won't be providing anything because they'll be out of business. Yeah, so, right. Mike, so, you have to know. I'm sorry, George. Mike, you do know that. Maybe you do, maybe you don't, but you do know that both the taxpayer um, um, and the insurance companies are senior in the capital stack to the homeowner. So if these companies go bust, the homeowner is probably going to be in a bad situation. But, 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 but even before you get there, even before that happens, the point is you, they can't keep – it's not economic to be running around continuing to offer new products. Forget about the installed base. Mike, you're right on that. We got that. Okay, that's not the point. The point is, on a going forward basis, they cannot continue to offer systems at this at, at these terms because it's just not economic. Um, it, it's like it's like selling dollar bills for seventy cents. It does, yeah. It's great right. for the consumer who's buying the dollar bill for seventy cents, but the guy who's selling the dollar bill is going to go out of business eventually. That's what Gordon is saying. Correct. All right, let's move on. Let's move on to the next to the next question. Emma, you'll go after Ag. He was before you. Ag, please unmute yourself. And then Emma, you're next. Hey, George, can you hear me? We got you. Yep, thanks, George. Yeah, so, Gordon, uh, great stuff. Uh, just wondering if you guys have uh, looked into the Inflation Reduction Act. There's a ton of stuff in there on investment tax credits, production tax credits. Uh, there's uh, Made in America tax credits, yep. wage tax credits. Is there a way to sort of game that bill to where suddenly these projects start to look uh, a little more uh, profitable, even on even if you disregard levelized cost of energy and all this other stuff. I don't know if you yeah. have looked at that at all. Yeah, so thanks. That's a good question. Essentially, to answer that question, let me not pretend that I'm a government expert. I'm not. But I do talk to three, uh, eight different government experts. And the short answer to that question is we don't know yet. They need to clarify a number of things to uh, uh, let us know how you qualify, what qualifies, etc. But let me just say this, and this may this may set a couple of people off, but I got to say it. Um, I do not believe Russia would have invaded the Ukraine if not for horrible energy policy from the EU that it seems like we're trying to mirror here. And let me explain. Effectively, what the EU did is they turned off distributed base load, coal, nuclear and natural gas and replaced it with, you know, intermittent peak load, in my view, unreliable solar and wind. And what that required them to then do when it became clear that they had made a mistake, instead of, you know, changing the mistake, they doubled down and then became, you know, relying on Russia for power. And I think that gave Russia a, a, a power of which they shouldn't have had. Um, you look at the energy costs in California versus the rest of the United States. It's like, you know, over the past 10 years, it's increased six times more than the rest of the United States. You look at the cost of energy in Germany. These are both places where they've done a lot of solar, in some cases, a lot of wind costs much higher than the rest of the EU. Um, and you look at the reliability of the power grids in both of those places, and it's deteriorated significantly. Um, so just, and, and, and then you think about how does all this work, right? So who's paying for all this solar, right? You, you know, you get these incentives, you get these tax credits, you know, it's a, solar is effectively a regressive tax on the poor. Like, you know, rich, poor people can't afford a $20,000 discretionary solar purchase. But they pay for your power by the utility redistributing those higher costs to, to, by, to, to everybody through higher electricity costs. So there's there's a moral aspect to it and there's a fundamental aspect to it. But I think no matter how you look at it, um, you know, solar is not the answer. And unfortunately, it seems like in the U.S., we're proceeding ahead currently like it is. Um, Gordon, totally agree on that. Uh, I think there's a complete ignorance around levelized cost of energy in these funding documents so i uh, would just you know point to stuff like that when the next time you see one of these where they've figured out all the production tax credit math and investment tax credit math because 
there are a ton of credits in that bill that they could potentially start pulling on, you know, so just uh, keep an eye out for that stuff. Yeah. yeah no so I, on that, um, I agree with Gordon and about the redistribution and how it's a regressive. Uh, for instance, my parents who are in California just fully went off the grid, all solar. They live in a place where there's a ton of sun, but they also had t- all kinds of tax credits and they're all savvy when it comes to doing that. And they had $50,000 to put down to just pay for it. So, I mean, you, other people are going to bear the brunt of the tax credits that they're getting, you know, that can't afford to just, you know, throw 50 grand around. Correct. <laughs> Emma, do you, have, do you have another question or point you want to make? And the other thing I was thinking was when he was talking about the uh, 25 year period with the 2.9% annual increase, that's that with compounding. I mean, if you're increasing at 2.9% for 25 years, it's going to be triple the cost 25 years later. Yeah, that's, that's so fair. I don't see that as very. Well, it's, I guess it's relative to everything else. Who knows? I mean, if. if uh... I prefer the utility. I don't I think I've unmiked myself somehow. I guess it depends where you live. Okay, thanks for that, Emma. All right, let's. Hey, hey Nostra. By the way, I, I love you. I, I read your this, your. I love your name, Nostra House of Dumbass. I love it. All right, House of Dumbass. Please unmute yourself. Ah, uh, thanks, guys. Um, Gordon, I have a EV that shan't be named question for you. Um, when it comes to the FSDs that um, they they sold without. Um, delivering the product i've seen on twitter multiple people who paid a couple years back and recently they've wrecked their cars and insurance has paid out but they refuse to pay the fsd as they shouldn't pay but the ev company that shan't be named refuses to refund the amount and that's where my question comes in and that has to do with um the current bulls in in the spaces they're talking about the i think it's 2.8 billion of uh, FSD deposits that they accepted, they're talking about something like uh, half of that, 1.2 billion being recognized as revenue in this current uh, quarter. Can you make sense of all this for me? Thank you. (laughs) Thanks, man. Uh, The the short answer is no, I can't. Uh, This is one of those things that has has shocked and awed us. It's one of the things we got excited about when years ago, You know, the California DMV um, uh, communication with Tesla lawyers came out and we were jumping on our stools because in that communication, Tesla's lawyers said we're at level two and we'll only ever be at level two. something along those lines. I don't know if that's the exact quote, but basically they implied that they're never going to be a level level two. The reason why um, that they said that is because they don't report um, the autonomous miles to. The California DMV, whereas, you know, the Cruz and Waymo and everybody else was, because if you're at level three, you have to report your miles. If you're, if you're not, you don't. Um, so it was like, while they lawyers were saying that in written, written documentation, I think Plain Sight dug up via a, a Freedom of Fairness, Freedom, whatever you call it, FOIA Act. Um, at the same time, you know, the company was doing uh, presentations where they were saying, you know, we're going to be at level five next year or whatever he was saying. Yeah. So. Uh, we thought we we were like, oh, man, we, we got him. We got him. And nothing happened. And nothing has happened. So, again, our running assumption is, and I'm not saying we're right, and, and some of the bears out there really get on me because this is our running assumption. But nonetheless, our running assumption is Tesla will never be um, uh, ridiculed from any government agency. And the only way to win on the short side is to get the uh, growth right and the, the, the competition right. And, again, I may be wrong there, but that's what we're running with for now, given – uh, we've got excited way too many times. We thought we had them dead to rights and uh, the government agencies just let them pass. So that, that would be our answer. The, the, the short answer, I, I can't explain it um, because um, I thought we had them years ago. When I say we had them, i.e., you know, we were saying this, this is bad technology. We were highlighting, highlighting Navigant's good work on this, in our view, good work, and saying that Tesla was ranked dead last. And then they came out and admitted it and nobody cared. So we'll continue to assume no one cares, but you're right in, in questioning it. Uh, I just don't know when it's going to actually come to fruition. Thanks for that. Uh, let's go to uh, Larry Stefanik. Larry, please unmute yourself. Yeah, thanks, George. Um, and if, if I, I came to the party late, so I, I saw Mark to Myth, and uh, it really caught my attention because I, I 
and, and if you guys already talked about this, then just, you know, dismiss me, I'll move on. But like the, the PE and VC write downs, like, I don't really have a feel for that. And I, I, I and it, it feels like there should be a cycle for it. I was there in 2001, watched, watched it happen. But like, if anybody kind of knows how to plug that into the macro, I know you're talking specifically about like the, the, alternative energy companies that are going to have to do write downs. But like, is there a, is there anybody that like has a, a feel for the cycle? And that's my question. Thanks. Yeah. George, can I address that? Or do you yeah, yeah, know, Gordon, go for it. Go for it. Yeah. So one of, there's a key, there's a couple of key things we're looking at. Um, um, we're looking at, so everybody looks at the feds balance sheet every week and says, okay, whatever their balance sheet does, that's a measure of liquidity point is i think liquidity is very 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 important that's a lot of varies but i think it's there's one thing i could look at and i had to invest money it would be how much liquidity is being pumped into the market and one way to monitor that is to look at it's not just the fed's balance sheet you also have to look at the tga the treasury general account and the reverse 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 repo if the tga is going down that's actually money going into the economy and if it's going up vice versa same thing for the uh, reverse repo. And then you, you do that. And then you also include the Fed's balance sheet. Um, and if you look at all of those things combined um, and you do, you know, TGA going up negative or reverse repo going up negative and then Fed balance sheet going up positive, you add them all up. Basically, over the past six months, there's been one point four trillion dollars of liquidity that's come out of the system, which historically is a lot. Um, so we look at that. We also look at um, all commercial bank assets cash assets they're down 144 billion dollars over the past six months and we also look at bank reserves held at the fed which is down a lot more than the fed's balance sheet is down um which are indications of liquidity in the system the point is mark demith you know dogecoin which was started as a joke being worth 10 billion or whatever it's worth now that's mark demith in our view um and what reverses that what causes a lot of that to come tumbling down in our view is liquidity coming out of the system. And it is happening. So I believe, to your question, when does a lot of this stuff start to reverse? I think we're in the beginning innings. I think, you know, I think George told me one, maybe it wasn't you, George, but somebody told me, you know, we're in the eighth inning. No, no, it wasn't George. This guy, Mark, Mark Maravani or whatever, is, he said we're in the, the late innings. No, we're in the beginning innings because, um, you know, the Fed, you know, taking their rate hikes from 75 basis points to 50 basis points and people assuming, that's, you know, that's them, uh, you know, uh, doing an about face. That couldn't be any further from the truth, right? They're still raising rates. Um, what the Fed really needs to do is start doing QE again. When they do QE again, in our view, you, you go long a lot of stuff. But they're not. They're doing QT right now. And it's actually happening. So I think liquidity coming out of the system is when a lot of this mark the myth goes away. Yeah, but like oh. one of the things I've been looking at is like, I mean, Insight Ventures, Tama Bravo, Benchmark, Index, like they're getting crushed, right? And and who are their LPs, right? And and like like how do I, I, I that sucking sound? I'm trying to figure yeah, out like so, how much yeah, suction's yeah, going on. Yeah, so 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 nose try. I think or Larry, I think where the problems were some of the early uh, movers, if you will. Um, you know, you have for instance some of the mutual fund complexes. I used to work for Fidelity. And as I'm sure you're aware, you know, a lot of these funds uh, have set aside, they put a few percent of their assets into these types of things. And it's one thing, you know, if you and I are, run, are running venture funds and I'm buying your crap and you're buying my crap and, and it's all good. But, um, um, you know, if you're, if you're Fidelity, the auditors come around and you've got liability. They, they, they need, they're the ones that will cross the street first. And so, um, you know, it's kind of funny. You look or funny. It's sad. You look at tiger global and I haven't looked the last month or two, but you know, you looked at the first six months and they were down, whatever they're down, like 50%, whatever the number was, I think they're down 55. I saw they actually lost money in October, despite the market rallying, whatever. But I, I think it's because they marked down the privates point is, you know, they were they were down 50, and I think they had only marked their privates down like 30 or 40 at that point, which makes no sense. I mean, if the publics are down 50, the privates should be down a lot more. So, but they're able to get away with it uh, until they're not. And so when it comes time for year-end nonsense, 
especially with some of the uh, mutual funds, you know, where you're getting money going in and out all the time. So they have to err on the side of uh, being more conservative because there's liability involved. That's where you start to see the cuts. And when they do it, it becomes harder for all the, uh, the fakers, the posers to continue to uh, uh, pretend, uh, you know, to go about with their make-believe. So, I don't know. That's just the way I see the cookie crumble. I think there's a, a long way to go. There was a great thread. I retweeted it. Maybe I'll retweet it out again. A great thread um, a couple months ago. Um, I can't remember. It guy with a really cool Twitter name. He was just making the point that if you take the risk-free rate, the 10-year, against which everything else is priced, and you take that, you know, you, you you mark that up to 250 basis points. You know, before you do anything else, you know, you just got to go down the cap structure. What does it mean for equities? You know, what does it mean for what does it mean for, for investment grade, junk, equities, leverage buyouts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And before you start even increasing risk premiums for, you know, where you are in the credit in the business cycle. I mean, you just to start the conversation. You got to mark this crap down thirty to fifty percent, and it's a lot worse than that. And I think people are just living in a dream world. And um, you know, I, 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 there's a, I, I, I think it, going back to what Gordon said, I mean, you know, we're certainly not in the eighth inning. You know, are we in the first inning? No. Are we in like I don't know, maybe the fourth or fifth inning? Maybe. There's a long way to go here. Still, I, I don't know. That's that's just my two cents. Yeah, I'm with you. Like, I mean, the bankruptcy stats might tell the tale, but like, it, there hasn't been. I mean, we got FTX, but we didn't get an Enron yet. We haven't had. Yeah, one. yeah, you know, and on that point, Larry and Michael Cantrowitz, it was funny. I remember a couple months ago, he's a strategist and Piper, probably the best strategist in the street, and, and there was discussion going on, and, and he he's been bearish, and it's one of the the questioners, speakers in the room, was saying, "Well, but there but there hasn't been a." You know, there, there hasn't been a car crash yet. You know, they, 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 everything's fine. And he goes, that's exactly the point. It's exactly the point. The cycle ain't over. The Fed ain't blinking until we get the car crash. And so, actually, you, you just mentioned credit spreads. I mean, I was just looking at HYG today and some other stuff. Spreads are remarkably well behaved. I mean, you want me to turn this room upside, upside down and, and light my hair on fire? I could start making up an argument like maybe we're not going to get a recession. I mean, you look at some of the indicators out there. I mean, yeah, it's like, like don't, I, I, I said it in jest. I don't really mean it. I think we'll get a recession, right? But let's be fair. I, I don't think there's a person in this room who, on January 1st, if they were told the U.S. tenure would be at 370, there's not a person in this room who would have thought that'd be possible without, without the whole world economy being thrown into a recession. Because remember the narrative, oh, it's so levered, if rates go up, the whole thing's going to blow up, blah, 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 blah. Well, it didn't quite work out that way. As a matter of fact, I could argue the other way. Real interest rates are still highly stimulative. Yes, there are parts of the economy, like the interest-sensitive part of the economy, housing, which is getting whacked. But the cost of capital for almost every other sector, is like a non-event. Companies are raising prices because they can. Laborers are demanding higher wages because they can. So, you know, and it was, a, again, it was a great tweet over the weekend. I can't remember who put it out. Um, and the gist of it was, you know, when everyone's expecting one thing to happen, something else is going to happen. You know, it's the truth we hold to, hold to be self-evident. We're going to have a recession. Well, what happens if we don't have a recession? You know, I'm not saying I know, but I'm just putting it out there. I mean, I am riddled with self-doubt on this question. Um, you know, parts of the economy are slowing very rapidly right now. But, on the other hand, now speaking to the great Michael Howell today, you know, if you look at the weight of the economic evidence over the last few months around the world, look at the city economic surprise index and other stuff, surprise has been all, uh, all on the positive side. So the only thing I'm certain of is uncertainty right now. So I don't know if that makes any sense. Hey, uh, uh, random, you want to say something? Go for it. Yeah, I, I just haven't seen any forced sellers yet when it comes to this particular topic that we're talking about when it comes to the solar, the bonds or the col uh, collateralized bonds or material. I haven't seen the forced sellers. A lot of them have enough 
balance sheet firepower to just make the payment at this point. So no one, like you said, with the spreads and the numbers just don't make any sense if this thing is starting to kind of creep up. No one's being forced to do anything. You're not going to see that until that forcing mechanism when either uh, the bottom drops out or, like he said, some of these collateralized loans actually have kickers in them where there's a 20 or 30 percent. Uh, they become less than a paper. So that that to me is what I'm waiting for and watching for. Yeah, and man. I guess that's why we're all looking around going, well, why is it? Where is the? Where is it at? And maybe it's the end of the year and they just are making the payments. Yeah, and it, their it, balance sheet is good enough. And Random, you know, it's interesting. What you just described on the corporate side with these solar things, you look at individuals, you know, we all read the same stuff. You look at the excess stock of savings. Yeah, okay, it's true, the, 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 the unfortunate... At the lowest end of the socioeconomic strata, they draw the short the, sh- the short straw. They always do. They're, they've exhausted all their excess savings. They're in a bad way, but it's the way it always turns out. You look though at the uh, upper end, there's still like I don't know, like a trillion and a half or two trillion dollars worth of excess savings. I mean, you know, okay, fine. So yeah, we all read zero hedge, and the malls were empty over the weekend. Blah blah blah. I get that. But there's a lot of stuff out there which is showing a lot of strength. And you look at, for instance, at uh, you look at the debt, uh, debt servicing ratio. I forget what they call it. The ability of consumers to service their debt, uh, debt, ob- debt servicing obligation ratio, whatever it is. Okay, It's extremely robust right now. So, you know, consumer balance sheets are in reasonably decent shape, as are corporate balance sheets. The real excess this time hasn't been so much there. It's been, it's been the government sector. It's been the sovereigns. They've been the ones that have been spending like drunken sailors. So I don't know. I, 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 I find myself, I question myself a lot recently about this. And, um, you know, we've all been looking for a recession, most of us, for quite some time now. And I'll freely admit I was wrong. I was looking for one starting as early as late second quarter. It hasn't happened. So I start to wonder. I really start to wonder. Um, okay, let's go now to, uh, hey, Storm, I haven't seen you for a while. Get up here. And then, uh, Adam, we're going to get you up here as well. Storm, uh, please unmute yourself. Have at it. Yeah, hey, I appreciate it. Tremendous uh, commentary by Gordon and always a great space, George. Um, my question for the panel is, you know, what, what are going to be the catalysts? Because I just feel like there's very little, if any, excitement. And maybe that's a long-term question. But what would you foresee to be the catalyst or the driver for, you know, robust upside. I'm not saying it's, you know, anywhere near, near term, but in your mind, what would be some of the leading indicators that would kind of be on your radar to look at? Um, since it, it, it seems or feels like there's a lot more fallout. The dominoes are just coming one at a time instead of, you know, all of a sudden or parabolic. Um, so that's my question. Thank you, George. So wait, so you're asking, what is the catalyst for like explosion, like things imploding? I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, no, it was a little mix. I, I mean, catalyst to the upside as as to like the future, you know, once once we do kind of plateau wherever we're going to plateau, what would be some catalyst drivers for an upside market? Because I just don't feel like there is any. I, I keep asking myself that question over and over again, and I just don't see any of the catalysts. Well, I think as Gordon was said. So, okay, I mean. Yeah, go ahead. Um, go ahead. Okay. So, I mean, if you, if you, you, we can't obviously forecast when this would occur, but if you watch ISM and you see a, a tick upward that is persistent, that could be somewhat of a catalyst. Um, I mean, it's, it's not looking very positive for the next year. Like, the, I mean, Bloomberg just did a poll um, of professional investors and it was all but like, 23% so 70, 77% said they expect stagflation next year so I mean I, I don't think there's that many great catalysts that, that come to mind but if you just watch watch all the indicators that's that's the way I see it yeah I mean I, I, I think especially, especially I, I, I them. Yeah, let me have a go at that I think as Gordon kept referencing I think he's right it's all, it, it always has been still is and always will be about liquidity I mean there's two if we just talk about equities, um, you know, the earnings side, I think, is pretty uh, outlook is pretty, pretty piss poor. Um, we can argue um, how much earnings are going to fall, whether they're going to you know fall 
10%, 20%, 30%, whatever. But that's not going to be a source of upside, at least for the next year. Um, and as far as liquidity side goes, um, you know, I, I, I guess the levers available to make markets hum, be it fiscal response or monetary response, those avenues are not so readily available right now. The liquidity side is not readily available until inflation comes down to a level uh, where to a much lower level. So that, that's a long ways off. And the fiscal side, I mean, I think, you know, there's no case for that now either. So to me, it's all about um, what's the downside and why I've been saying for a year now, and I continue to believe, you know, subject to these counter trend rallies, such as we've seen in the last six weeks, equities represent return free risk, minimal upside. And in my view, not a very likely probability of an upside versus what's arguably much greater downside and a much higher probability associated with that. So I don't, I don't frankly, I mean, to me, if the market was flat over the next year, that'd be a huge, a huge win. I, I just don't see, I mean, maybe there are others on this panel who are more bullish and would like to articulate a, a more positive case, but, but I, I personally can't see it. Uh, Adam. Um, I just wanted to add one thing. Please. Yeah, oh, go okay. for it, Emma. Go um, for it. So one thing I'd definitely be watching is the transition of uh, Bank of Japan and Kuroda in April because when the, they're literally going to be stuck between a rock and a hard place when that transition occurs. Kuroda is just going to hold on, try and cap yields at 25 basis points, which literally serves as an artificial suppressant to sovereign bond yields globally. So I would be watching and trying to figure out what's going to happen there because if the new contendant or the one that people think people think he's going to take his place, if he set, if he actually does anything in terms of allowing those yields to go above that 25 basis point level for any extended period of time, uh, you're going to see the GPIF blow up. You'll see Japan itself's balance sheet will that it'll blow up. I mean, it, you'll see huge reverberations across markets. And then on the other hand of that is if they don't, then the yen. So I mean, I think th that's one of the big things to be watching. Hey George, can I can I just yeah, go, go yeah go for it? Corey. Just go real for quick, it. a couple of things that you said. What what, what, what would you look at? Um, a couple of things I'd recommend. It, it might be the two best leading indicators historically for recessions have been the Conference Board Leading Economic Index for the U.S. and the Braves Butter Kelly Leading Index. Um, I would also... Wait, hold, on, at, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait, say that again slowly for everybody. The first one is the Conference Board. And what's the second one? Uh, the Braves Butters Kelly, the BBK Leading Index. Okay. And then I'd look at the the, the 10 threes. That, that's the 10-year minus the three-month yield. Um, and then... So those are the best leading indicators, secondary leading indicators, and the, there's some questions around these, but just just the fundamental secondary leading indicators. I look at the Conference Board Consumer Confidence Index, and then Manufacturing Average Weekly Hours. Those would be the four I'd look at. Fair enough. Okay, so uh, Adam, uh, welcome to the stage. Please unmute yourself. Great, thank you, um, George. Back to what you were saying previously about the robust consumers, and and I uh, agree. But I was also looking at the Fed's recent data, and they show personal savings, not the savings rate, but the personal savings balances are down. Uh, I think they're around like six hundred billion now, from four point five trillion in twenty twenty. Do you see that as playing a uh, a role on excess consumption? As all that's being worked down, but now that it's at like a fourteen year low, and it's probably getting lower because of the savings personal savings rate is also diminishing. Do you see that uh, stalling consum discretionary consumption next year? I have to confess, I'm, I don't spend a tremendous amount of time on Fed watching, but and I may be mistaken, so I want to preface that right up front. Yes, savings are down considerably from where they were a year or two ago as the excess savings are being burned off. But, and I can, I can tweet it out, the, the graphs I was looking at showed that total consumer savings, excess financial assets are still significantly i think a billion and a half or two billion dollars above where they were in 2020 so maybe we're looking at different data but but from memory that's that's the data that i recollect were you, were you seeing something different yeah i was looking i'll post mine up in the net it was just the personal savings balance but um they might have converted it into other assets of course like you know u.s household wealth is still high so i just didn't yeah. know if, uh, that was something that i was missing or if it was just uh 
you know, something that was going to squeeze discretionary spending further in 2023. No, I mean, I, I mean, the, the people I read that know a lot more about this than I do, again, with exception, and I feel badly for those at the low end of the totem pole that drew the short straw, with the exception of those folks who burned off their excess savings, their, their financial assets, everyone else is flush right now. Um, that seems to be the consensus of, of, uh, of, what, of what I read. If you put your stuff up in the nest, you know what I'll do? I'll tweet out something. I'll tweet out something tomorrow and we can, we can compare notes. Um, but yeah, you know, the real incomes for everyone is being squeezed by inflation. Um, but the funny thing is, you know, inflation the last couple of months, you've seen actually an acceleration. By the way, I want to say something else. We'll put it in the mix. If you really want to, if you really want to get confused, it was a great space yesterday where, where Neely, most of us in this room know who Neely is, really smart cookie out of Minnesota. She follows the consumer like a hawk. Um, she had a really interesting observation. But point is, the last last couple of months, consumption's actually been accelerating. People say, well, it's because inflation's coming down, oil prices are coming down, et cetera, et cetera. But she had a different observation I had never heard before until yesterday. Um, I tend to take what she says to the bank. but And what I really like about this is no one has been talking about this. No one. And she went on this... Uh, on this story about how there's been excess um, tax withholding um, that people have been over, over withholding. And as we get into late February, which I know is a long time from now, but uh, assuming the world hasn't come to an end by late February, when we get into tax refund season, late February and March, there's going to be a tremendously large number of tax refunds handed out that people have been over withholding. And the way she gets to this, she explains how the tax laws changed, and don't push me on this, uh, but my recollection was, you know, we had the tax law change in 2017, 18, whatever, and the forms um, had to change, and the forms were confusing, and the point is that um, with the large degree of turnover that's been occurring in the job market uh, in the last year or two, as people change jobs, they have to fill out this form. And so um, there's been over withholding. They fill out the new form. People are confused what to do with the form. And so I know I'm butchering the explanation, but the gist of it was, we probably should get it. You know, Emma, we should get Neely in here to do a space so you can explain all this. But she was making a case for you're going to see significant tax refunds come uh, come the end of February. If someone else can more cogently and articulately make the case, have at it. I, I can tell you what the conclusion was. I'm sorry I butchered the explanation so badly. Um all right, let's let's bring a few other folks in here. Uh, we're going to bring in Gerald, and then we're going to bring in uh, Indy eighty five. So, Gerald, please unmute yourself. Gerald, we can't hey, hear George, you. Please unmute you yourself. Yo, speak up, please. George, uh, so I, I was just curious uh, what your thoughts were about over a year of negative real wage growth. Um, I mean, a lot of economic forecasters are looking at initial claims as a forward-looking indicator of what the Fed will do. But if you're looking at negative 3% wage growth for the broad population over a year, I mean, what do, what do you make of that data in the face of the people saying there isn't an inflation occurring? No, I'm a huge inflation. I mean, I, I've been, I'm on the inflation. Uh, I don't want to put, put labels on me, but I'm, I'm in the camp that inflation is going to be stickier at a higher trajectory for longer than the consensus believes um we had the great vincent deliard in our space a couple of weeks ago and he said to give it proper context you have to understand how we got to where we were the three factors which brought us the great disinflation namely cheap energy cheap goods cheap labor they've all stopped or reversed cheap energy we know the story cheap labor, cheap goods with deglobalization and shortening of supply chains and cheap labor, we literally have run out of labor in this country. So no, I'm on the uh, uh, higher inflation for longer. Yes, inflation's peaked. It's not the issue. It's the wrong question. The right question is how long will it take to come down to what the authorities deem to be acceptable levels? Many people are saying, oh, it'll get to two, three percent by you know the fourth quarter of next year. Um, you know, I'm I'm not so sure of that. Uh, and furthermore, I would say that with the long bond at three point seven percent, it's already baked into the price. Um, so yes, you know, oil prices are falling right now, given the upset we've seen in China with, 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 with the COVID outbreaks, you know, let's see what, how that plays once we get past this. Uh, the fact of the matter is we've done nothing on, on the supply side to help the energy equation. The only reason oil prices are down is because of the demand side, but this too shall pass. 
labor side. Um, if you look at the uh, wage gains, not just year on year, but sequentially, they're still extremely robust. Um, you know, employment cost index is, is running very high. If you look at the gap in wage gains between those who are quitting their jobs and staying in their jobs, I think the quitters are making seven and a half and the guys staying are making five and a half. Still an extremely tight labor market. So energy, we talked about, um, uh, you know, the only way we're going to get cheap energy is we're going to get a big recession. The only way we're going to get wage gains really coming off significantly is if we have a recession, i.e. you've got to cut, you got to put a whack into co- corporate income statements, then they'll shed labor. And then uh, lastly, cheap goods. It was a whole China situation. Um, you know, to the extent that we onshore stuff and, and, and you see deglobalization, that's another source of stickiness for the inflation rate. So what's important about this is, look, nobody knows. I don't know. Nobody knows. But if inflation winds up, you know, plateauing at four or five and not two, then explain to me again why the U.S. long bonds at 3.7 percent pretend I'm a golden retriever or a small child. So, no, I, I'm not in the. I, I, I'm not in the low inflation camp, so um, I don't know. if I, I think I gave you the answer you wanted, but it wasn't the answer you expected. <laughs> uh, Indy, did, Indy did, uh, sorry, Joel, do you have a follow-up? Okay. Indy, Indy, do you have a question? Please unmute yourself, Indy. Indy, are you there? All right. Uh, Adam, you got a follow-up? Raise your hand. Please unmute yourself, Adam. Yeah, you were um, talking about the fiscal tax returns earlier, um, and I had a question for you regarding uh, like a global bond shortage over the year. So if the U.S. government, uh, their deficit's down by 50 percent over year, still big, 1.3 trillion for the year, but it's down significantly versus last year. And then you have the Fed um, letting bonds run off their their books. And there's over two trillion in the reverse overnight reverse repo. And we're seeing China run current account surpluses and you know, back to buying bonds at this point. Do you see bond yields going low because of like a shortage of new bonds outstanding compared to demand? Or do you just see rates going higher? I don't have a, I don't have a strong feeling on bonds right now. I, I, I'm a, I'm a dumb equity guy. Um, and, you know, even if I had a bond view, I would tend to express it through equities. Um, you know, I, I think bonds represent bad value. Um, you know, whether, whether yields continue to go down, prices continue to rise as they have the last couple of months because everyone thinks the world's coming to an end. Okay, fine. Um, but, you know, if rates, are, if rates are going down for that reason, it's not good for equities. Um, and so I'm basically an equity guy. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm careful what I say here. Um, I don't think bonds represent a good long-term investment. Let's put it that way. Tactically, can they work? Yes. But I don't think they represent a good long-term investment. Did you have a follow-up? Oh, that was it. Thank you, sir. Good. Outsider, did you have a question? Yeah. No, I, I just wanted to thank you for the for this and, and Gordon. Um, I just wanted to touch on one thing. You know, most people think that when the Fed starts cutting, you know, spreads are going to calm down and everything's going to be all right. But, you know, looking back to September 07, when, when Bear Stearns, or June 07, when Bear Stearns hedge funds collapsed, and then um, all the all the fallout from that, Coventry, and um, all the other stuff that happened at the end of 07, that's when the Fed started cutting, was, was in October. And spreads didn't peak till 15, month, 15, 15 months later um, at the end of 08 when they announced TARP and TELF, which is when all the, uh, you know, issuers were able to come back into the market. And then middle and late half of 09 is when all the cash buyers came back in after TELF and that revived the markets. But <clears throat> it had a more do with all the programs that were implemented rather than the Fed cutting. So. I think even if the Fed does start cutting next year, it's still going to be a lag, lag effect to where spreads peak out. And spreads obviously are important um, to cor- you know corporations, um, you know who aren't the government, um, and 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 that can make it pain, you know, just a little bit more painful of a runway than I think most are anticipating. I, I feel like a lot of people think as soon as the Fed starts cutting, that everything gets back to normal. It just doesn't bear out if you look at history. Yeah, I, I pour gasoline on your fire. Um, if you look at when the Fed starts cutting, it's usually when, when equities really start to go down. It's because they're cutting because things are getting worse. So uh, I couldn't agree with you more.
Excellent observation. Hey, George, uh, can I address the bond question quickly? Yeah, go for it. Go for it. All right. So just so you guys know, um, you know, the Fed started quantitative tightening in, in June, effectively. Um, and if you look at over the past six months, the Fed's balance sheet has dropped by $292.891 billion. But the Treasury general account has went down by $342.061 billion, which is effectively – Janet Yelling running down the TGA, which is an infusion. It's, it's like stimulus. So that's completely offset um, the decline in the Fed's balance sheet over the past six months. However, the TGA is at $479.474 billion right now. And she said she's going to start running that back up in December. We'll see if she does. But if she does, that's effectively them issuing more bonds, thus prices down, yields up. So – Theoretically, if, if 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 Janet Yellen does what she says she's going to do, I would think that bond prices are about to face um, some downward pressure and yields will face, uh, face upward pressure as a result of shifts in the TGA. Just FYI. Thanks for that, Gordon. Uh, outsider, do you have something? Yeah, just just that. I mean, you know, when, when Gordon earlier was talking about the, the 75 percent uh, Kroll, uh, it, you know, uh, advance rate and, and the deal he was referring to. I mean, the, the, the 95% to 75% fall in, in bond prices is solely related to duration risk right now. Um, and it's just originating lower coupon loans and having the cost of funding go up. And, and it's very, um, it, it really reduces the value of those, those loans that, that you're uh, securitizing. Um, but, you know, we really haven't even seen, that's just duration risk. We really haven't seen um the uh the credit risk show up yet and and that usually does and when when the conversation turns from uh rates to credit that that's when typically you see the 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 bottom fall out but it, it hopefully is a short period of time because everyone will probably come to the rescue at that point but um but that's just something that hasn't even hasn't even shown up at all yeah yet. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more in fact in parallel fashion when you look at hyg you know, the ETF for high yield, the decline can fully be explained by um, duration, very little to do with credit risk. And, um, you know, I actually, it's funny, I don't, I'm not trying to be argumentative, I just want to point out something. Um, and that is, I actually hope that spreads widen out. And I hope we have bankruptcies and financial accidents. And the reason I say that is not because I want to pad any potential profits on short positions. But we've had so much malinvestment, so much out misallocation of capital, where because uh, there's been no price discovery, horrible decisions have been made. And um, this has so it's just not about, you know, comparing investment returns and my returns are bigger than yours, or yours are bigger than mine. There's a really economic effect to this. And this nonsense has to stop. Fewer investments in dating apps and food delivery services. And how about a few more holes in the ground for extractive industries, more infrastructure? So I view destruction of capital in these areas, which will be facilitated by a rise in the cost of capital, as a good thing. It's healthy for the system. It's like, you know, the, the analogy I'm sure you've all read, it's like if you go in the forest and there's no fire for a long, for a long period of time, more underbrush accumulates and eventually, when the fire comes, it's really, really bad. You need to have the periodic cleansing. That's what I—that's the analogy I would use. Emma, do you want to say something? Oh, uh, yeah, I did. I'm now I'm trying to remember what it was about. Um, it was a. Uh, Sorry. Oh, oh, one of the things I wanted to mention that is curious is when we were when uh, Gordon was talking about the Treasury General account. Um, it's actually interesting because if you think about it, when the Fed is tightening. They are reducing the, you know, they are selling, uh, they're selling bonds. So they're making available more treasury bonds in the market. And so if Yellen is also selling treasury bonds, we're therefore adding more treasury bonds into the general market, I would think into the euro dollar market. And so it's just kind of interesting if you think about it that way. And when, when we're doing QE, we're actually taking treasury bonds out of the market, which tend to be the thing that is used for collateral. Just a thought. I don't know exactly what to make of it. It's but given 
the reaction of markets, but we could be seeing, I mean, we've seen some liquidity issues in the treasury market. So who knows? Yeah. 